If you follow The Last Humans, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, and like this video. Thank you for your time. The expanse of space stretched out endlessly, punctuated by twinkling stars and the luminescent glow of distant galaxies. The Daedalus, a jewel in the Galactic Federation's crown, made its approach towards the Galactic Council. From the bridge, Commander Ilias watched, his eyes widening in quiet admiration, not at the gathering of ships, but at the monumental space station that held the Galactic Council. The station, an engineering marvel, loomed like a titanic fortress, its intricate structures and lights making it resemble a floating metropolis. It was so vast that it made the already sizable Daedalus seem like a mere speck in comparison. Beside Ilias, Mira leaned slightly forward, her eyes wide. I knew the council station was large, but this, it's colossal, she whispered. Garrow, usually not one to be easily impressed, simply said, Yeah, it shows what we can do when we come together. Inside one of the Daedalus's suites, Ambassador Elyra of the Helian Collective took a moment to compose herself. This grand display of power and unity was intimidating, even for her. She took a deep breath, readying herself for what was ahead. The Daedalus signaled its intention to dock. Responding, a massive hangar bay door from the space station slowly opened, guiding the ship inside like a hand welcoming a much smaller one into its grasp. With precision, the ship nestled inside, and its engines powered down. No sooner had the Daedalus confirmed its secure docking, Admiral Selene led a delegation towards its exit ramp. He was there to greet and escort the Helian ambassador to the council. The ship's gates lowered with a hiss, revealing Elyra. Her poised figure stepped gracefully onto the platform, silver hair reflecting the hangar lights. Selene extended his hand. Ambassador Elyra, welcome to the Galactic Council. Your presence and the knowledge you bring are of utmost importance. Elyra accepted the handshake, her grip firm. Admiral Selene, it's an honor. The Helian Collective understands the gravity of our shared situation. We are here to help in any way we can. With a nod of understanding, Solan replied, Very well, Ambassador. The Council is eager to hear from you. Given the urgency of the Drac threat, they've decided to convene without delay. As they walked side by side, the weight of the galaxy's fate seemed to press down upon the vast station, making every moment all the more critical. Elyra's mission was clear, to forge an alliance that could potentially change the course of the war against the Drac, voices of unity and offer of aid. The Galactic Council Chamber was a sight to behold, a vast amphitheater, adorned with glowing symbols representing all the member species, seated representatives from across the galaxy. The air pulsed with anticipation, and a hush fell as Elyra stepped onto the central platform. A senior council member, a tall humanoid with iridescent skin, rose. Ladies, gentlemen, and esteemed beings of the Galactic Council, we present to you Ambassador Elyra of the Helian Collective. Elyra took a moment, letting the silence stretch, then began. Representatives of the Galactic Federation, I stand here as a testament to unity in the face of adversity. My people, the Helian Collective, were once much like yours. But when the shadows of the Drac loomed over our systems, we united. Our shared struggle against this adversary has gifted us not just unity, but also a profound understanding of their tactics and technologies. The chamber remained silent, hanging on to her every word. Elyra continued, her voice echoing off the chamber walls. We've faced the Drac in the dark corners of the galaxy, evading their sweeps, outsmarting their probes. This struggle has driven our technological advancements. Today, I offer our knowledge and our tech to you, not as conquerors, but as allies. She paused for a moment, letting the weight of her words settle, then added, The Helian Collective proposes a joint venture. Let us enhance a selection of your Federation vessels with our technology. Together, we can strengthen your fleet's weapon systems and cloak them with our advanced stealth capabilities. With this combined might, we can present a formidable front against the Drac. Whispers spread through the chamber like ripples in a pond. Garrow, sitting among the delegates, leaned over to Mira. She's good. The Helian tech could be a game changer. Mira nodded, her eyes fixed on Elyra. Let's hope the Council sees it that way. As Elyra took her seat, the debate began. Council members rose one by one to voice their opinions. An avian representative from the Signian cluster remarked, 
The Drac threat is real. If the Helian Collective's technology can give us an edge, I say we embrace it. However, opposition was inevitable. A representative with scales shimmering under the chamber lights countered, How do we trust this newfound ally? What if this is just a ruse, a strategy the Drac are employing to weaken us from within? The debate continued for what felt like hours. Arguments and counterarguments, hopes and fears were all laid bare. Finally, the senior council member who had introduced Ilyra rose once more. It's evident that the stakes are high and time is of the essence. While concerns are valid, the potential benefits are undeniable. All in favor of a provisional alliance with the Helian Collective and the proposed tech integration, signify by raising your emblem. A sea of emblems, glowing in various hues, rose. The majority had spoken. With this, we ratify a provisional alliance with the Helian Collective, the senior member declared. The chamber erupted in a mixture of applause and murmurs, marking the start of a new chapter in the Federation's defense against the Drac. Preparations and Confirmations The colossal Galactic Council space station buzzed with activity. Hangar bays, previously silent and orderly, now rang with the cacophony of engineers, crews, and machines. Battle cruisers, each an imposing behemoth of power and precision, were selected for the crucial journey to Helian space. Their mission was clear. Assimilate the advanced technology of the Helian Collective and return stronger, stealthier, and more formidable. On board one of the cruisers, technicians and strategists huddled, discussing the anticipated upgrades. The energy was palpable. One could almost touch the mix of excitement and responsibility that charged the air. The success of this venture could very well dictate the outcome of the impending confrontation with the Drac. Amidst this flurry of activity, in a private chamber within the council station, Solane initiated a secure comm link. The holographic display flickered and then stabilized to reveal the hardened visage of General Zorvan. The rebel leader, with his chiseled features and piercing gaze, always commanded attention. General Zorvan, Solane began, choosing his words carefully. The Galactic Council has ratified the terms we discussed. Amnesty is granted to you your commanders, and your entire force. The Federation recognizes the value of every ally in these trying times. Zorvan's demeanor, usually stoic, betrayed a hint of relief. Commander Solane, your council's decision is wise. Our differences are inconsequential compared to the threat looming over us. The Drac are relentless, and the more hands we have on deck, the better our chances. Solane nodded. Speaking of new allies, there's something, or rather, someone you should know about. He proceeded to brief Zorvan about the recent developments with the Helian Collective. The rebel leader listened intently, absorbing every detail. And their gravimetric sensor, Selane continued. It's something we've never seen before. The capability to detect Drac drones, potentially even their cloaked ships, could tip the scales in our favor. We're working tirelessly to replicate and integrate this technology into our fleet. Zorvan raised an eyebrow, clearly impressed. The Helian Collective's technology sounds promising, Selene. This could be the very advantage we've been seeking. Selene could feel the tide turning. Every decision, every alliance was setting the stage for an epic confrontation. I trust, General, that with your expertise in guerrilla tactics, your fleet would be instrumental in utilizing this technology to its fullest potential. A slow grin crept onto Zorvan's face. Commander, give us the tech, and we'll ensure the Drac have nowhere left to hide. Their conversation, underpinned by mutual respect and the gravity of their shared mission, concluded with assurances of swift integration and collaboration. The Federation was fortifying its ranks, and with the rebel forces joining hands, their collective strength was poised to challenge the Drac's reign of terror. Strategy and Cohesion The next day... Inside the Galactic Council's central chamber, a strategic summit convened. Leaders, tacticians, and advisors from different corners of the Federation came together, circling a massive hollow table displaying an expansive map of the galaxy. Ships, marked by blinking dots, represented the vast resources at the Federation's disposal. The map was awash with trails, potential pathways the Drac drones might use to relay information back to their masters. Selene stood at the helm, a pointer in hand, highlighting critical choke points and areas of interest. 
Our intelligence indicates the highest likelihood of DRAC drone activity in these sectors, he began, his voice echoing across the chamber. Their modus operandi is stealth, intelligence gathering, and evasion. Conventional methods won't corner them. We need a new approach. All eyes shifted as another figure strode to the center. General Zorvan, flanked by his top commanders, faced the gathering. A hush descended. His reputation preceded him, and many in the room had either fought with or against him in the past. After speaking with Salon and securing the amnesty, Zorvan wanted to personally attend this briefing. With a nod from Selene, Zorvan began outlining his strategy. Guerrilla warfare is about adaptation and exploiting vulnerabilities. These drones think they're the hunters, lurking in the shadows. We turn the tables. We become the predators. Zorvan's voice was cold, precise, like a blade being sharpened. With the Helion's gravimetric sensors, we won't just detect these pests. We'll hunt them down. Selene interjected. And that's where the wolf pack plan comes into play. General Zorvan and his fleet will be our wolves. Their ships, retrofitted with the sensors, will scout, track, and eliminate the Drac drones. We believe that with their guerrilla expertise, they are best suited to take on this mantle. Murmurs of agreement echoed throughout the chamber. While Zorvan's tactics were unconventional, they had merit. As for command logistics, Salon continued, addressing what many wondered about, General Zorvan's fleet will operate under the broader strategic objectives of the Federation, but it's paramount that we trust their tactical judgment in the field. Zorvan nodded. My fleet knows how we operate. While we'll align with the Federation's larger goals, my commanders and I will dictate the tactics, adjusting as the situation demands. We've thrived in the unpredictable, and that's the strength we bring. An advisor from the back posed a question. How do we ensure smooth communication between your fleet and ours, General? Real-time intel sharing will be critical. Zorvan smirked. We've been intercepting your signals for years. I think we'll manage. A chuckle rippled through the room. The tension was palpable but undercut with a grudging respect for the rebel general and his audacity. As the summit drew to a close, detailed plans were initiated for the seamless integration of Zorvan's armada. Collaboration nodes were set up, data channels were synchronized, and for the first time, the rebel fleet was represented on the Federation's hollow map. Their dots blinked in unison with the rest, a symbol of unity. Zorvan and Selene, once adversaries, now allies, shared a final look. The weight of what lay ahead was immense, but with every alliance forged, the Federation's stand against the Drac grew sturdier. The galaxy was uniting, and in this unity, hope was reborn. In the sprawling expanse of the galaxy, Away from the unified front the Federation was presenting, a shroud of darkness enveloped a secluded sector. This was Drac territory. Cold, silent, and unyielding, it was a void where hope seldom ventured. But within this abyss there was movement. Five colossal Drac ships, their hulls a deep obsidian, shimmered against the faint starlight. These weren't just ordinary vessels. They were behemoths, symbolizing the might and ruthlessness of the Drac Empire. Each ship's design was an intricate maze of terrifying artistry, an embodiment of a civilization that thrived on conquest and subjugation. Their destination was set for the planet Orinthia, a luminous world on the fringes of Federation space. Orinthia, with its azure oceans and emerald landmasses, stood as a beacon of life and prosperity. But its position made it vulnerable, a soft underbelly amidst the vast territories of the Federation. Unknown to the Orinthians and the Federation's vast intelligence network, these Drac Leviathans made their steady, silent advance. There were no transmissions, no signs of their approach. Their advanced engines leaving no trails or detectable energy signatures. They were ghosts, moving through the vastness of space, their intentions insidious. Descent into Darkness Cold metal met bruised skin as Reese and Lyra were thrown unceremoniously into their new prison. The harsh thud of their landing was immediately followed by the echoing clang of a large door, sealing shut behind them. Pain throbbed through their bodies as they struggled to rise, their vision blurred and their heads swimming from their recent interrogations. But it was the pervasive sense of hopelessness that weighed heaviest on their souls. They found themselves in a massive, dimly lit holding area. 
It stretched beyond the boundaries of their immediate vision, with high walls that seemed to swallow up what little light existed. Vague shapes moved around in the semi-darkness, some slumped against the walls, others huddled in groups. There was a cacophony of groans, hushed whispers, and muted sobs, occasionally drowned out by the sharp, distant sound of a guard's command. In the dimness, Ries managed to catch Lyra's eye. Both spies, they'd faced countless challenges together, but nothing quite like this. Lyra's usually fierce eyes held an unfamiliar glint of vulnerability. He reached out and grasped her hand, squeezing it firmly as if to convey a silent promise that they would find a way out of this mess. Where are we? Lyra's voice barely rose above a whisper, yet it broke the eerie silence that had settled around them. Some sort of holding area, Reese whispered back, squinting to try and make out their surroundings better. It's massive. Look. Following his gaze, Lyra's eyes widened as they traced the vast expanse of the prison. Multi-leveled platforms, interconnected by a series of rickety bridges and ladders, formed the complex's infrastructure. All around them, various alien races, some humanoid, others not, were restrained by the same fate. One particular group caught Reese's attention. Four beings, their bodies covered in bioluminescent scales that glowed faintly in the dark, sat in a circle. They were communicating in a series of melodic tones, their heads tilted backward and their mouths open wide. Lyra's gaze settled on another trio, tall, lithe creatures with feathered wings that seemed too fragile for flight, their plumage dulled and dirtied by captivity. It's like a menagerie of the galaxy's misfortunes, Lyra whispered, a hint of anger in her voice. Reese nodded, taking in the sheer diversity of species imprisoned alongside them. We don't even recognize half these races. How far and wide have the Drac spread their tyranny? As they navigated their way deeper into the prison, trying to find a less conspicuous spot to recuperate and plan, an old being approached them. Its fur, once probably a rich shade of blue, was now matted and dirty. Its eyes, milky with age, still held a spark of curiosity. You're new here, it rasped. Humans, from the look of it. You're far from home. Reese, ever the diplomat, replied, it seems we've taken a wrong turn. And who might you be? The creature chuckled, a low, gravelly sound. Name's Taran, and you might say, I'm a bit of a historian in this wretched place. I've been here long enough, at least. If you've questions about your new neighbors, I might be able to help. Lyra, her gaze never straying from Taran, whispered to Reese, Maybe he knows a way out, or at least something that can help us. Reese nodded in agreement, ready to grasp any thread of hope. And as the trio settled into a shadowy corner, the tales of countless races and worlds, all subjugated by the Drac, began to unfold. Stories of struggle. Taran's tales seemed endless, each one more harrowing than the last. As hours slipped by, a crowd had gathered around the trio. In the darkness, captive faces illuminated by the sporadic glow of bioluminescent beings listened intently. This assembly, it seemed, sought solace in shared experiences and the whispered dreams of freedom. One story in particular caught Lyra's attention. It was the account of Maelin, a tall, slender creature with an iridescent exoskeleton emanating a soft cyan glow. We were a peaceful society, Maelin began, his voice resonating with a haunting echo. The Astrala, living in harmony with our world's delicate ecosystem, but the Drac saw potential in our planet's unique flora. They sought to harvest it, irrespective of the damage they caused. As Malin spoke, his exoskeleton shifted in hue, mirroring the spectrum of emotions he went through. From the serene blues of peaceful memories to the angry reds of invasion and conflict. They overwhelmed us, not with brute strength, but with their sheer numbers. We resisted, Malon continued, his color now a fierce orange. But one by one our cities fell, our forests burned, and our people enslaved. Moved by the tale, a feathered creature, Lithia of the Varan species, decided to share her story next. She spoke of vast skies and open air, and how her people once soared without constraints. But then the Drac came, shrouding their world in darkness and caging them, literally and metaphorically. Each story held a pattern, a peaceful world, the arrival of the Drac, resistance, and eventual capture or subjugation. Yet, amid the melancholic tales, threads of hope were woven. 
Many spoke of resistances that still existed, of hidden bases and guerrilla warfare. Amid the stories, Lyra and Reese could sense an opportunity. They exchanged glances, realizing that this prison, this dark, sorrowful place, might just be the nexus of alliances they had been searching for. Reese took a deep breath and spoke up. Each of us here has a common enemy. The Drac have taken our freedom, our homes, and for some, even our families. But look around you. We are a formidable force combined. With the knowledge and experiences we share, we can mount a resistance like no other. A murmur of agreement spread through the crowd. Lithia fluttered her diminished wings. But how do you propose we do that, human? We are all prisoners here. The Drax security measures are unparalleled. Before Reese could respond, a voice interrupted from the back. Not entirely unparalleled. All eyes turned to a cloaked figure stepping into the dim light. As the hood fell back, it revealed an aged face, scarred and weathered, but with bright, calculating eyes. I am Arlon, once a prince of the Denari Empire, he declared, his voice tinged with both pride and sorrow. My people fell, but I led a rebellion and many still pledge loyalty to me. If we get out, I can rally them, but escape is no small feat. Reese and Lyra shared a look of intrigue. Here, in the bowels of the galaxy, they'd stumbled upon a potential ally, someone with resources and influence. Then let's start there, Lyra said determinedly. Let's find a way out and bring our stories, our strengths back to our worlds. Let's turn this prison into the first step of our collective fight back. A hushed wave of whispered agreement spread through the assembled captives. In the face of adversity, the spark of rebellion was lit. A glimmer in the gloom. The vast chamber's melancholic atmosphere changed as Reese, Lyra, Prince Arlon, and Lithia huddled in a shadowed corner, away from prying eyes. Though these talks were hushed and hurried, every word echoed with hope and urgency. The first moon rise. Lithia whispered, her voice steady. That's our window. There's a guard shift then. They become complacent, assuming we're all resigned to our fate. Arlen looked intently at Reese. But escaping this chamber is only the first step. How do we get past the guards and the security systems? Reese sighed. That's the challenge. If our stealth ship is still intact. If we can just reach the hangar. It's undamaged. A soft voice from behind them interjected. Startled. They turned to see a guard, his uniform partially hidden beneath a cloak. His features were strikingly similar to Arlen's. Draven? Arlen whispered in surprise. The guard nodded. They captured me before the invasion on our planet, forcing me to serve them by threatening our family. When I saw you, I knew we had a chance. The reunion was touching, but time was of the essence. Can you guide us to the stealth ship? Reese inquired. Hope glinting in his eyes. Draven nodded. During the third moon rise, I'll be on duty near this chamber. I can guide you through the less guarded paths. Lyra interjected. We won't leave you behind. Draven looked resolute. No, my place is here for now. Once you're out, I'll work from inside. I'll create chaos with the ship's systems and let the other prisoners out. While they try and contain the riot, you should be able to slip away undetected. As the group began to draft a plan, Reese took a moment to reflect. Our stealth ship only has seats for two, but we have extra storage space to fit two more people. It's going to be tight. Once we're out, we can jump to hyperspace. The Drac ships will be too slow to catch us. Lithia, with her knowledge of the ship's systems, would be invaluable, and Arlen's tactical prowess was irreplaceable. They would join Reese and Lyra and attempt an escape. Their escape wouldn't just be a personal liberation, It'd be a beacon of hope for all the races imprisoned there. In the days that followed, every move was measured. Every conversation weighed for importance. The stakes were clear. If they were discovered, retribution would be brutal. Yet even in the weight of impending escape, an alliance was forming. The tales of the Federation that Reese and Lyra shared gave Arlen and Lithia a broader perspective. Perhaps if they managed to flee, they can add their strength and numbers to the Federation, it could present a formidable challenge to the Drac. The moon cycles of the prison ship continued, bringing them closer to their chance. The weight of anticipation was palpable, but amid the fear and uncertainty, there was a budding hope. The thought of flying free, of reigniting the fires of resistance, spurred them on.
The drac might have captured them, but they would never break their spirit. Testing the waters. On the other side of the galaxy, the enormity of space seemed both confounding and fascinating. Floating against the dark void, the Galactic Council's massive space station stood as a testament to their resolve and unity. Not far from it, a small vessel, its sleek hull reflecting the distant stars, drifted. This was the Vigilant, captained by the resilient Captain Hale. Hale stood on the bridge, surrounded by the hum of consoles and the subdued chatter of the crew. The ship's first mission after the catastrophic encounter with the Drac was of paramount importance. On a platform, bathed in soft blue light, was the gravimetric sensor, a piece of Halian technology with potential capabilities still not fully understood by the Federation. Initiate the sensor, commanded Captain Hale, his voice reflecting a mix of anticipation and apprehension. A crew member hesitated for a split second, before nodding and activating the device. The device whirred, its sound resonating with the heartbeat of everyone on board. All eyes darted to the main screen. Suddenly, the calm of the room was shattered as four distinct dots appeared on the screen. The sensor had detected something. Battle stations, Hale shouted. The crew, trained for moments like these, immediately jumped into action. As alarms echoed throughout the ship, Hale opened communications to Zorvan's vessel, still stationed near the Galactic Council. We have four contacts, Zorvan, Hale said, urgency evident in his voice. I'm sending you the live feed. Engage Alpha and Omega drones. I'll take the other two. The feed showed the outlines of the drones, their design eerily organic, but distinctly Drac in nature. Captain Hale steered the vigilant towards the closest Drac drone. With practiced precision, he locked onto the target and fired. Bright beams of energy erupted from the ship's cannons, striking the drone and obliterating it into a shower of debris. Not far, Zorvan's vessel danced through space, swiftly closing the gap to its target. The ship unleashed a salvo of projectiles, impacting and shattering the Alpha Drone. The remnants of the once threatening enemy scattered, blending with the stars. But victory was not yet complete. The other two drones, sensing the impending danger, began to accelerate, attempting to escape the Federation's wrath. Track their trajectory. We can't let them escape, Hale ordered. The Vigilant lurched forward, its engines roaring to life as it pursued the fleeing adversaries. Speed was on their side, and they were gaining. Zorvan's voice crackled over the comms. They're fast, but not fast enough. We have them. Both Federation ships closed in, and within moments, the escaping drones met the same fate as their counterparts, reduced to debris amidst the vast cosmos. On the bridge of the Vigilant, Captain Hale let out a deep breath, his hands slightly trembling as the weight of the moment settled in. That was close, he remarked, the gravity of their discovery not lost on him. This is what we're up against, but now we have a fighting chance. Zorvan's face appeared on the screen. His eyes, fierce with determination, looked straight at Hale. Now we know the sensor works. Let's mass produce these and hunt every last drone down. Hale nodded in agreement. The era of the Drac remaining hidden ends now. Zorvan's grin was almost predatory. It will be my pleasure, he declared. The parting thought was clear. The Drac had awoken a united, technologically advanced, and determined enemy. The Federation was ready to strike back. The Federation's space dock, known as Alpha Nexus, was abuzz with activity. Alpha Nexus, an immense structure floating in the void, could house entire fleets, Today, it hosted General Zorvan's flagship and several of his vessels. Ships of various sizes and classes floated, anchored by quantum tethers, as smaller service pods darted around them. Bright lights illuminated the silhouettes of engineers and technicians as they clambered over the ship's exteriors, fitting them with the newest piece of technology that held the promise of turning the tide against the drac, the gravimetric sensors. Inside one of the ships, Captain Larith tapped at the terminal his fingers dancing over the holographic interface. The sensor's readouts displayed a myriad of information. He squinted, trying to understand the flurry of data. A voice from behind startled him. It's overwhelming at first, isn't it? Turning, he found Zorvan approaching, his authoritative aura unmistakable. Lareth straightened. General Zorvan, sir, it's an honor. 
And yes, the influx of data is vast. Zorvan smiled. You'll get used to it. This is the edge we've been waiting for. He looked at the screen, appreciating the nuances. These sensors see the undetectable, giving us a window into the Drax's movements. A small chime resonated in the chamber. It was the ship's AI. Gravimetric sensor calibration at 93%. Estimated full operational readiness in three hours. Zorvan nodded, pleased. Good. Once they're ready, we'll have the eyes to see where none could before. Lareth's curiosity peaked. Sir, the Helian technology is truly astounding. Do you believe with their continued assistance and these upgrades, we can gain an upper hand in the war against the Drac? Zorvan looked thoughtful. The Helians have shown us a path we hadn't seen before. Their technological prowess combined with our determination, it's a formidable combination. I believe with these new tools and further collaboration, we can certainly tilt the scales in our favor. Their conversation was interrupted by a soft chime. Lareth's console displayed a live feed of the dock. The remaining ships of Zorvan's fleet were gradually being fitted with the new technology. Engineers looking minuscule against the vastness of space flitted about, diligently installing and testing the sensors. One of the engineers, a bright-eyed young woman named Talia, floated towards a service pod after completing her task. Through her comm, she reported, Vessel 4's gravimetric installation complete. Running diagnostics now. Zorvan overheard the update. Talia's team is efficient. By the time the Sol rises, six of my ships will be equipped, ready to pierce the dark shroud the Drac hide behind. As the two continued discussing strategy and the nuances of the new equipment, Alpha Nexus itself seemed to hum with anticipation. Every corner of the dock reflected the Federation's dedication, resilience, and hope. The clock was ticking. The Federation was evolving, arming itself not just with weapons, but with the knowledge and capability to foresee what lay ahead. As the hours passed, the anticipation grew. The ships, their crews, and the entire Federation waited for the moment they would embark on a mission that would either save their universe or see it plunge into an abyss. Only time would tell which. Journey to the Helian Collective. The vast expanse of space stretched out before them, filled with stars, nebulae, and the unknown. At the forefront of the fleet was Elyra's vessel, sleek and silent, a testament to Hellion engineering. It stood out, its design markedly different from the Federation ships it was guiding. Elyra herself was on the bridge, her eyes focused on the navigational array before her. Around her, Federation officers worked diligently, each one aware of the importance of their mission. The gravimetric sensor on board Elyra's ship hummed softly, its display showing a clear path through space. Every once in a while it would ping, indicating potential obstacles, but so far, no Drac presence. We have a clear course for the Helian Collective, Elyra said, her voice confident. Stay close and keep an eye on the sensor's feed. The Drac drones may be lurking. Captain Jorvis of the lead Federation ship, the Star Strider, nodded. Understood. Our ships are at the ready. The journey may be perilous, but we're prepared. Simultaneously, far from their location, General Zorvan's fleet began its own voyage. The newly installed gravimetric sensors on his ships were already proving invaluable, pinpointing regions in space that had previously been blind spots. The mission was clear. Seek and neutralize any Drac drones entering or operating in Federation territory. On the bridge of his flagship, General Zorvan stood with a determined gaze. These drag drones have been operating in the shadows, gathering information. With these sensors, we can blind them and cripple their reconnaissance. His tactical officer, Lieutenant Dries, looked up from a monitor. First readings are coming in, Captain. There's an anomaly three parsecs away moving erratically. It matches the known patterns of drag drones. Zorvan's eyes sharpened. Set a course. We'll intercept. Back with Elyra's convoy, the journey was relatively calm. The vast stretches of space between the Federation and the Helian Collective were filled with wonder and beauty. Nebulae shimmered in a dance of colors, and distant galaxies painted the canvas of the cosmos. Yet beneath this serene setting, there was an undercurrent of tension. Every crew member, from ensign to captain, knew that danger could lurk behind any asteroid or within the shadow of any star. Elyra often found herself standing beside the large panoramic window on her ship's bridge, 
The sight of the Federation fleet, moving in formation, gave her hope. Their combined might, and the upcoming Hellion enhancements, would surely turn the tide against the Drac. As hours turned into days, the fleet approached the outskirts of Hellion territory. The Collective was a marvel in itself, an alliance of systems and planets, each contributing to a harmonious existence. Suddenly, a soft chime resounded on Alira's ship. The gravimetric sensor had picked up something, a faint blip moving rapidly towards them. Drac drone, approaching from the starboard side, shouted one of her officers. Captain Jorvis immediately responded. All ships, defensive formation. Elira, stay in the center. We'll handle this. As the Federation ships took their positions, the lone Drac drone, perhaps emboldened by its unknown findings, zoomed forward, attempting to evade and continue its recon mission. Elira sighed in relief as the fleet managed to corner the drone, ensuring it couldn't relay any information back. One less spy in the cosmos. Thank you, Captain Jorvis. He smiled. All in a day's work. Let's continue. The Helian Collective awaits. The two fleets, separated by light years but united in purpose, continued their respective missions. The universe watched, holding its breath, as the next chapter in the Federation story unfolded. A vision of unity. Ambassador Salon sat in his well-appointed office aboard the Federation's main starbase. His large desk was flanked by holographic displays showing various star charts and tactical plans. Despite the vast array of technology around him, his focus was solely on the flickering communication panel in front of him. Elira's face shimmered into view, the backdrop of her ship's bridge visible behind her. Ambassador Selene. She greeted, her voice clear despite the light years separating them. Ambassador Elira. Selene acknowledged with a slight nod. It's good to see you again, even if only through a comm link. I trust your journey with our ships is progressing well? Elira's lips curved into a small smile. Indeed, Ambassador. The Federation fleet is capable. And with the guidance of our gravimetric sensor, we have avoided any unforeseen encounters. We're making good time to the Helian Collective. That's good to hear, Selene remarked. The quicker we can get those upgrades, the better our chances in this conflict. Elira nodded, her gaze serious. Ambassador, I've been pondering our alliance, the partnership between the Helian Collective and the Federation. I envision more than just an exchange of technology. I see a future where our forces stand united, not just as allies, but as one. Solane leaned back in his chair, intrigued. Go on. She took a deep breath, passion evident in her voice. Imagine, if you will. Helian battle cruisers flying side by side with Federation ships. A joint fleet. A force to be reckoned with. These vessels won't just be symbols of raw firepower. They'll represent the unification of our knowledge, our science, our very cultures. Elira continued, her voice rising with emotion. We've been in contact with some of your top scientists, and the enthusiasm for collaboration is palpable. Our research teams are excited about working hand-in-hand -hand with Federation scientists, unlocking new possibilities, pushing boundaries, and forging a new chapter in interstellar development. Selene, visibly moved, responded, Your words resonate deeply, Commander. For too long, the universe has been a place of division, of isolated pockets of civilization. This vision you speak of, it's a beacon of hope in these trying times. Alira's eyes softened. Ambassador. The universe is vast, filled with wonders and threats alike. The Drac are but one of the many challenges out there. By merging our strengths, we're not only ensuring our mutual survival against a common enemy, but laying the foundation for a brighter, unified future. Selene paused, processing the weight of her words. The Federation has always believed in seeking out new life and civilizations, forging alliances and promoting peace. Your vision aligns perfectly with our core beliefs. Elira's lips turned upwards. Our scientists are eager to come aboard the Federation starbases, to share, to learn, to innovate. Once the fleet returns with the upgrades, we'll be sending two of our finest battle cruisers, along with a delegation of our brightest minds. Together, we can turn the tide against the Drac and usher in a new era of prosperity and unity. Solan stood up, a gesture of respect. Ambassador Alira, 
The Federation will welcome your cruisers and the brilliant minds aboard them with open arms. I believe this alliance, this partnership, could be the universe's best chance at enduring peace and progress. Elyra saluted. Until our paths cross again, Ambassador. Salon returned the salute. Safe travels, Commander. The Federation awaits your return. As the communication link closed, Selane found himself lost in thought, buoyed by hope and determination. This alliance, this vision of unity, might just be the key to securing a future for all. Orinthia's Distress Ambassador Selane had just concluded his uplifting conversation with Commander Elyra when Serenity was abruptly shattered. The Federation's command center, ordinarily an emblem of order and discipline, was thrown into a frenzy. Red alerts flashed across the walls, accompanied by the shrill cry of the emergency klaxon. Officers, generally poised and focused, were now in a rush, shouting commands, initiating defense protocols, and darting to their battle stations. At the main console, a junior officer rapidly decoded the distress signal, his fingers skimming across the holographic interface. The expansive display screen at the command center's forefront activated, revealing a live feed from Orinthia's orbit. The tranquil blue world was eclipsed by the menacing silhouettes of several Drac ships, their sinister hulls shimmering threateningly in the distant star's weak glow. Their intent was evident, invasion was imminent. A sinking feeling gripped Ambassador Selene's heart. Orinthia, a pivotal outpost on the edge of Federation territory, was invaluable. Its fall would devastate Federation morale and offer the Drac a strategic advantage for further incursions. Council members issued rapid orders. I need fleet stats. Admiral Krell bellowed. How long until the closest backup reaches Orinthia? A voice rose amidst the turmoil. The closest fleet will take hours to get to Orinthia. Another officer chimed in. Initiate evacuation orders for the Orinthian populace. But in this bedlam, Ambassador Selene's voice resonated powerfully, overriding the tumult. Locate General Zorvan! A technician responding promptly displayed Zorvan's recent coordinates. Sir. She began, her voice trembling yet distinct. General Zorvan and his six ships were patrolling the Lamor sector. They're closest to Orinthia. And their estimated time of arrival? Solan questioned. Considering their current speed and trajectory, approximately one hour. She responded. Salan's gaze hardened. Contact General Zorvan immediately. He needs to be briefed. Acknowledging with a nod, the technician sent an urgent message. Turning to the War Council, Selene stated, Zorvan and his ships are our primary hope. Equipped with the gravimetric sensors, if they reach Orinthia in time, they might stand a chance. Admiral Krell concurred. The Drac won't anticipate their counter. Activity surged in the command center as communication lines opened. Defense stratagems were devised, and all resources were deployed to assist Zorvan's squadron. However, an undercurrent of apprehension lingered. They faced formidable odds, and the magnitude of the impending clash weighed heavily. From a subdued corner of the command center, a video stream showcased Orinthian civilians looking skyward, their expressions a fusion of awe and dread. Children clutched their parents. Communities drew together, seeking solace in unity. In the distance, ships, laden with refugees, soared from the planet's surface, making desperate bids for escape. Oblivious to the frantic orchestrations transpiring light years away, they placed their faith in the Federation's distant guardians. On an open communication channel to the Galactic Command, the determined face of General Zorvan appears. We're on our way at the fastest possible speed, he asserts, his voice unwavering. Back in the war room, Solan's eyes meet those of Admiral Krell. He's up against five Drac behemoths, he murmurs with a mixture of hope and trepidation. I'm not sure even Zorvan is up to that. The vastness of space rippled as General Zorvan's squadron of six battlecruisers burst forth from warp speed, bearing directly down on the besieged planet Orinthia. Each ship, sleek and imposing, gleamed menacingly as its engines hummed with a latent energy, ready for battle. The sight before them was as magnificent as it was haunting. The immense Drac behemoths, stretching out in an intimidating line formation, mercilessly bombarding Orinthia below. Streaks of violent energy rained down from the Drac ships, tearing into the planet's surface, creating massive explosions. Plumes of smoke rose, scarring the beautiful blue and green landscape that once represented life and harmony. Now, 
It symbolized devastation and desperation. General Zorvin's sharp eyes took in the scene in a matter of seconds, his brow furrowing at the sight of the bombardment. Every instinct in him screamed to dive headfirst into the conflict, but he knew that strategy and precision would be crucial. All vessels form attack pattern Delta. Zorvin's voice rang out, echoing with clarity and purpose. Our primary target is the Drac Behemoth on the right flank. Focus all firepower on that ship. In response, the six Federation cruisers swiftly adjusted their formations. Their sleek designs contrasted sharply with the looming, monstrous aesthetics of the Drac vessels. Each Federation ship powered up its weapon systems. The Veritane enhanced torpedoes humming to life, poised and ready for Zorvin's command. On the bridge of Zorvin's flagship, officers and crew worked feverishly, coordinating with the other ships, optimizing shield frequencies, and locking onto the designated Drac behemoth. All torpedoes locked and ready, General, reported Lieutenant Mara, her voice holding a hint of anxious anticipation. Zorvin nodded, his jaw set with determination. On my mark, fire. As if choreographed, a salvo of bright torpedoes streaked through space from the Federation ships, zeroing in on their target. The torpedoes impacted with ferocious power, creating a series of brilliant explosions across the hull of the targeted Drac ship. Beams of laser fire accompanied the torpedoes, each strike hitting with precision and power. The behemoth tried to retaliate, sending out an array of defensive measures and attempting to evade, but the focused assault was relentless. Every time it tried to patch up a damaged section, another barrage would hit, widening the damage further. Keep up the pressure, Zorvin shouted, feeling the first taste of hope. The bridge was filled with a cacophony of sounds, the rapid beeping of consoles, the tense orders being relayed, and the occasional cheer as they saw the behemoth falter. But amidst the focused assault, a more somber sight was unfolding. Smaller ships, desperate to escape the nightmare below, darted from Orinthia's surface. They were not warships, but civilian transports, filled with refugees hoping to escape the carnage. Their desperate trajectory, however, took them perilously close to the Drac behemoths. Zorvin's heart clenched as he watched the scene unfold. Each transport represented countless lives, hopes, and dreams. Protect those ships at all costs, he commanded, hoping to provide them with a safe passage. However, despite their best efforts, the distance and the overwhelming might of the Drac behemoths meant they could only do so much. One by one, the Drac fleet targeted the fleeing vessels, mercilessly picking them off. The heart-wrenching scene fueled the determination of Zorvan and his crew even more. Their relentless assault on the Drac behemoth continued with renewed vigor, as they hoped to make at least one enemy pay for the suffering caused. And as the part closed, it was evident that the tide of battle was only beginning to turn, with much more at stake than anyone could have imagined. Shift in the tide. As the relentless assault on the Drac behemoth continued, it was evident that Zorvin's strategy was taking its toll. The massive enemy ship, which had once seemed invulnerable, was now smoldering with huge breaches in its armored exterior. Sparks flew from its once mighty weapon ports, and its defensive shields flickered intermittently. The Federation cruiser's Veriton-enhanced firepower was proving more formidable than anyone had anticipated. But the moment of triumph was bittersweet, overshadowed by the grim sight of the civilian vessels being struck down. Each explosion served as a painful reminder of the price of war. The bridge crew's initial cheers slowly gave way to a silent determination. Everyone knew what was at stake. As the beleaguered Drac behemoth showed signs of critical damage, Zorvan called out. Prepare to target the next one. We need to give our people more time. However, the other Drac ships had been observing the engagement closely. Not willing to see another of their kind fall, the four remaining behemoths began to change their formations. Almost in unison, they started to rotate and angle their enormous hulls toward Zorvan's squadron. Their move was clearly defensive, seeking to shield their wounded kin from further harm. The pause was momentary. Suddenly, with a harmony that spoke of shared consciousness or an eerily synchronized AI, they unleashed a concentrated salvo of energy projectiles toward Zorvan's ships. Space around the cruisers lit up with brilliant flashes as deadly projectiles hurtled towards them. General Zorvan, realizing the imminent threat, shouted, Evasive maneuvers brace for impact. 
Despite the crew's best efforts, the onslaught was overpowering. Zorvan's fleet, though advanced and nimble, was significantly outnumbered and outgunned. Two of the Federation ships took direct hits. One cruiser's shields failed instantly under the barrage, causing a massive explosion that ripped it apart. The other ship, though still intact, was severely crippled, its engine trails flickering as it struggled to maintain formation. General, we've lost the Serena and the Pulsar is heavily damaged, reported Commander Rael, his voice filled with anguish. The weight of leadership pressed heavily on Zorvan. Each lost ship was not just metal and tech, it was filled with brave souls under his command. He clenched his fists, the usually stoic general allowing a hint of anger to pierce his features. The scene on the bridge was chaotic, with alarms blaring and officers shouting reports and orders. But amidst this, a senior officer, Captain Trell, voiced the sentiment on everyone's minds. General, we can't leave the planet. What about our people? Zorvan took a deep breath, steadying himself amidst the turmoil. We can't help them if we're dead, Captain. He replied grimly, making a heart-wrenching decision. All ships disengage and regroup. We need to fall back. But retreating wasn't so straightforward. The Drac behemoths, sensing the tide of battle turning in their favor, pressed their advantage. They pursued the Federation ships, firing volley after volley, determined to not let a single one escape. Zorvan, drawing upon his years of experience, led his fleet in evasive patterns, using asteroid clusters and the magnetic fields of Orinthia's moons as cover, trying to break line of sight with their pursuers. The game of cat and mouse was tense, with the remaining Federation ships narrowly avoiding several devastating barrages. As the cruisers managed to gain some distance, Zorvan received a priority transmission from the Galactic War Council. The holographic figure of Admiral Krell appeared. General Zorvan, rendezvous with the main Federation fleet, two parsecs away from your current position. Zorvan nodded. Understood, Admiral. We're on our way. The Federation cruisers, their once shining hulls battered and scorched, engaged their warp drives, vanishing from the vicinity of Orinthia. Behind them, the malevolent behemoths turned their attention back to the beleaguered planet, resuming their ruthless bombardment. Betrayal from within. Several light years away, aboard the sprawling Drac behemoth, Rice, Lyra, Arlon, and Lithia found themselves trapped amidst a vast sea of cold metal and oppressive despair. The ship's air, thick with tension, seemed to suppress every ray of hope. Yet, in the quiet corners of their cells and the shadows of the corridors, a delicate plan had started to form, anchored by an unlikely alliance. Deep within the ship's dimly lit chambers, Arlen leaned closer to Rice and whispered, Remember, on the third moonrise, everything changes. Rice gave a curt nod while Lyra, using her delicate fingers, subtly communicated in a series of coded hand gestures to Lithia. The latter, a master of deciphering the most cryptic of messages, instantly understood. Among the Drac guards, one stood out. Draven, with his upright posture and a distinct scar running down his left cheek, seemed like any other dedicated guardian of the Drac Collective. But hidden beneath that formidable exterior was a past intertwined with Arlen's. Years ago, on a clandestine mission, Arlen had saved Draven, leading to an unspoken bond between them. Now, with the universe at stake, Draven's loyalty to his savior was about to be put to the test. The third moonrise was nearing. From the behemoth's transparent sections, one could witness the celestial events beginning as the third moon of Orinthia started its ascent. Its silver sheen painted the ship, making everything momentarily ethereal. As the Drac guards prepared for their shift change, taking a momentary reprieve, Draven made his move. Accessing the ship's control panel with a stolen code, he deactivated the containment fields of the holding cells. Instantaneously, doors slid open and out poured the prisoners, confused, angry, and desperate. The behemoth turned into a battleground. Some prisoners, acting on pure instinct, attacked the Drac guards, using any improvised weapon they could find. The chaos served as a diversion, drawing the attention of reinforcements and overwhelming the ship's internal security. Using this pandemonium as a cover, Draven swiftly met with Arlen's group. This way he commanded, leading them through a labyrinth of passageways. 
Every turn they took, every corridor they entered was calculated, following a path Draven had meticulously planned. As they maneuvered, they encountered pockets of Drac resistance. With a cold, clinical efficiency, Draven neutralized them. His allegiance to Arlen was clear. Each shot he fired against his kin was a testament to the depth of his loyalty and the gravity of their mission. Lithia, with her profound knowledge of alien technology, aided their escape by periodically disabling surveillance nodes, ensuring their movement remained undetected. Meanwhile, Lyra, ever the protector, watched their six, ensuring no surprise attacks would hamper their progress. Reaching a concealed junction, Draven input a sequence into a hidden panel, revealing an elevator. This will take us directly to the hangar. The stealth ship is there, he said, urgency evident in his voice. As the elevator doors slid shut, the team took a moment to breathe, the weight of their daring escape pressing on them. They had ignited a firestorm, but the most challenging part was yet to come. The lift's doors opened, revealing the vast expanse of the hangar. There, nestled between massive Drac war machines, was their salvation, the sleek, nimble stealth ship, its design a stark contrast to the behemoth's brutalist architecture. Their escape was within reach, but first, they would have to overcome the final line of Drac defense. The guards, alert to the unfolding escape, had already started converging on the hangar. Drawing his weapon, Draven said, Go, get to the ship, I'll hold them off. The promise of a reunion and the hope of freedom spurred the team forward as they charged towards the awaiting vessel. Draven reached out to open the hangar doors from the control panel. They were almost free. Flight of the stealth ship. Rice sprinted ahead, his legs pumping, the roar of the ensuing battle filling his ears. He could hear the shouts of Drac guards and the unmistakable hum of energy weapons. Yet above it all, the steady beat of his heart, synchronized with the rapid footsteps of his allies, resonated loudest. Lyra, her reflexes honed by countless skirmishes, deftly dodged incoming fire, providing covering shots for Arlen and Lithia. Arlen, meanwhile, directed them towards the stealth ship, his memories of it clear as they had discussed the layout previously. The sleek vessel, with its aerodynamic contours and shimmering exterior, stood waiting. Rice, recognizing the familiar silhouette of the ship they once piloted on their spy mission, felt a surge of hope. As they drew closer, Lyra moved swiftly to the access panel, her fingers dancing over the touchpad. Within moments, the boarding ramp lowered with a hiss, revealing the ship's familiar interior. Lyra, help me take off, Rice shouted, moving to the pilot's seat. Without hesitation, Lyra took the co-pilot's position, her hands flying over the controls, initializing systems and priming engines. Outside, the battle intensified. Draven, a one-man army, held his ground against the swarm of Drac guards. Each shot he fired found its mark, creating a barrier between the pursuers and the stealth ship but the numbers were against him and every passing moment saw the enemy drawing closer. Rice, unwilling to leave a comrade behind, opened a side hatch and aimed his weapon, sending a barrage of suppressive fire at the incoming Drac forces. Draven, now! He yelled. Draven, seizing the momentary respite, sprinted towards the stealth ship. However, as he neared, a sudden blast knocked him off his feet. One of the Drac had managed a direct hit, Lithia's scream pierced the tension-filled air, but there was no time for grief or hesitation. We have to go now, shouted Arlen, his voice heavy with urgency and sorrow. The stealth ship roared to life, its thrusters pushing it upwards. The massive hangar doors began to close, attempting to trap the ship. But Lyra, showcasing her exceptional piloting skills, navigated through the narrowing gap and out into the vastness of space. Once clear of the behemoth, Arlen activated the stealth ship's cloaking mechanism, rendering them nearly invisible to the Drac sensors. But they weren't safe yet. As they gained distance, smaller Drac interceptors began their pursuit. Lyra's fingers danced over the controls, evading the oncoming attackers. Hold on, she yelled, executing a series of maneuvers that showcased the ship's agility. Rice, manning the onboard weapons system, managed to take down several interceptors, but their numbers were overwhelming. We can't keep this up, Rice yelled. We need to make the jump to FTL. Arlen, poring over the navigational charts, quickly plotted a course. Aligning for FTL jump, he announced. 
Moments felt like hours, the tension palpable as Drac ships closed in. With a blinding flash of light and a surge of power, the stealth ship jumped, leaving the Drac interceptors behind. The vast expanse of space stretched ahead, with stars blurring as they entered FTL. If you follow The Last Humans, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, and like this video. Thank you for your time. The vast canvas of space, dotted with stars and pulsating with energy, played out like an ethereal theater from the bridge of Carvon's behemoth. The enormity of the ship was dwarfed only by the magnitude of Carvon's ambition. As the supreme commander of the Drac fleet and a symbol of the Drac's might, he stood tall, unyielding, his reptilian eyes scanning the planet of Orinthia below. Unlike the Federation, the Drac didn't see planets in terms of beauty or life. To Carvon, Orinthia was a resource, a glowing blue and green gem to be harvested, utilized, and assimilated into the ever-expanding Drac Dominion. The relentless bombardment, a rain of violent energy upon the surface below, was not a destruction in his eyes. It was an assertion. He tilted his head slightly, listening to the harmonic hum of the ship's core. It was a melody of power and precision, and it was music to his ears. Around him, the bridge was a buzz of activity. Officers relayed reports. Crew members monitored screens displaying complex algorithms, and the atmosphere was one of cold efficiency. Lieutenant Narx. Carvon's voice echoed, both commanding and calm. Update. A slender Drac officer stepped forward, his dark scales reflecting the ambient light of the control panels. Commander Carvin, the Orinthian defense grids are 76% neutralized. Their communications have been intercepted, and the local populace is in disarray. We predict full control within three solar rotations. Carvon nodded, a gesture more for Narx's understanding than any Drac instinct. Proceed as planned. Make sure the assimilation units are prepared for deployment. The affirmative was barely out of Narx's mouth when a sharp, piercing alarm resonated across the bridge. Instantly, the crew moved into a higher state of alert their training evident in their swift reactions. Unidentified fleet emerging from warp. One of the sensor officers called out. The massive hollow screen at the front of the bridge flickered to life, displaying the sudden appearance of Zorvan's squadron. Six sleek, predatory ships gliding with purpose. Carvon watched intently, recognizing the insignia on the Federation vessels. General Zorvan. He mused aloud. I've heard tales of his exploits. This will be... Interesting. A whisper of conversations began among the officers. The Federation's audacity to challenge the Drac so directly was unexpected. Most knew of Zorvan's reputation, a master tactician, a warrior of renown. But they were Drac, and their faith in their own superiority was unshakable. Carvin observed as the Federation ships adjusted their formation, their movements fluid and coordinated. The dance of strategy was about to begin, and both leaders knew the steps. It was a matter of who could outmaneuver the other. Commander, Narx approached cautiously. Our initial scans suggest they're targeting the behemoth on our right flank. Perhaps a diversion. Carvon contemplated for a moment. Or a strategy. Zorvan is known for his precision strikes. He aims to weaken us one ship at a time. There was no panic in Carvon's demeanor, only a heightened interest. Alert the targeted ship. Have them bolster their defenses and prepare for a direct assault. While the bridge prepared for the impending confrontation, deep within Carvin was an emotion rarely felt. Anticipation. This would not be a simple annexation. It was a dance of two galactic powers, and the galaxy was watching. As the Federation's torpedoes burst into life, their fiery trails illuminating space's darkness, Carvin felt the weight of leadership. He had countless battles under his belt, but this one against Zorvan promised to be legendary. Let them come. Carvon whispered to himself, his gaze unwavering. We shall see if the Federation's might matches its reputation. In the vastness of space, as two titans prepared to clash, the destiny of Orinthia and its inhabitants hung in the balance. The vastness of space was momentarily set aflame by the Federation's unexpected tactical maneuver. Their decision to concentrate fire on a single Drac behemoth was not one Carvon had anticipated, and the sudden onslaught left his fleet momentarily disoriented. Through the maelstrom of explosions and chaos, he discerned the Federation's underlying strategy, 
isolate, attack, and decimate his ships, one at a time. It was a classic maneuver, yet executed with such precision that even Carvon, in the depths of his reptilian heart, felt a flicker of admiration for Zorvan's tactics. On board the besieged behemoth, alarms blared and warning lights illuminated the bridge in a frantic dance of red. The ship's captain, sensing the dire situation, transmitted distress signals across all channels. Commander Carvon, we are under heavy fire. Shields are degrading faster than we can reinforce them. Carvon's eyes, usually so cold and calculating, now burned with determination. He quickly realized that if the beleaguered behemoth fell, it would serve as more than just a loss of firepower. It would be a blow to the Drac's pride and reputation. The Federation was trying to send a clear message, and Carvon had no intention of letting them succeed. Realigning his fleet with swift, decisive commands, Carvon orchestrated a protective formation around the besieged ship. His smaller craft swooped in, drawing the Federation's fire and deflecting it from the behemoth. Protect the behemoth at all costs. Redirect energy from non-essential systems to shields and weaponry, he ordered. In the midst of this tactical rearrangement, Carvon found himself watching the fleeing civilian crafts from Orinthia. Their desperate flight, a silent testament to the Federation's commitment to protect its own. While he struggled to understand the emotional connection that humans had with their kin, he couldn't deny the lengths they were willing to go to ensure their safety. Could this be their Achilles' heel? The Drac had no such sentimentality. For them, the weak were culled, and the strong survived. It was a brutal way of life, one that had ensured the Drac's dominance for millennia. But now, as Carvon gazed at the protective arc the Federation ships formed around the civilians, he wondered if their human emotions, their sense of duty and love, could be turned into a liability. A plan began to form in his mind. If he could distract the Federation by threatening the civilian ships, perhaps it would buy him the time he needed to regroup and retaliate. Yet as the battle raged on, another thought, uninvited and unsettling, began to niggle at the edges of his consciousness. The humans' unyielding spirit, their willingness to sacrifice for the greater good, posed a question that Carvin had never truly pondered. What drove such creatures? Was it mere survival or something deeper? Shaking off the distraction, he returned his focus to the task at hand. The Federation's relentless assault continued, but with the Drac fleet's realignment, they now presented a more united front, proving they weren't so easily outmaneuvered. The behemoth, though damaged, still held on, its crew working fervently to patch up damaged systems and bolster its flagging defenses. Carvon's communicator buzzed, Commander, reinforcements from the Zephyr Quadrant are en route. A slow, satisfied smile spread across Carvon's face. The tide was turning. The Federation's gambit had been bold, but the Drac were far from defeated. Now, as the two mighty forces continued their celestial dance of war, the Drac leader harbored a newfound respect for his adversary. This wasn't just a battle for territory or dominance. It was a clash of ideologies, a testament to the enduring spirit of both races, and for the first time in eons, Carvin felt the thrill of uncertainty, a sensation both exhilarating and terrifying. The outcome of this conflict was far from predetermined, and the universe watched with bated breath. The nebulous theater of war, dotted with flares of red, green, and blue from clashing ships, suddenly reverberated with a different kind of intensity. Having been caught off guard once, the Drac fleet, under Carvon's meticulous command, began to demonstrate why they were feared across galaxies. Their ships, pulsing with a chilling blue hue, synchronized in movement and purpose. With cutting-edge tech and seamless coordination, they started to unleash a barrage of energy, turning the tables against the Federation. Amid the cacophony of blasts and retaliatory strikes, Carvin's voice rang clear and cold across Drac comms. Target their civilian crafts, he ordered, his tone devoid of emotion. There was a brief pause among his subordinates, not due to reluctance, but sheer surprise. Attacking civilian ships directly was not just audacious, it was a stark statement. Lieutenant Yurkai, one of Carvin's most trusted officers, quickly grasped the intent behind the order. You aim to demoralize them? He mused, not really expecting an answer. Carvin's eyes fixed on the fleeing civilian crafts, 
small specks against the expansive backdrop of the universe. The Federation needs a reminder of the price of boldness, he replied tersely. The next few moments seemed to stretch for an eternity. Brilliant streaks of energy shot out from the Drac fleet, homing in on the defenseless civilian ships. One by one, the crafts erupted in flames, their desperate attempts to evade proving futile against the Drac's advanced targeting systems. The universe bore silent witness to the ruthless assertion of the Drac's dominance, a chilling demonstration of power over compassion. For the Drac, it wasn't about cruelty. Cruelty implied emotion, a capriciousness in the act. This was calculation, strategy, sending a message in the language of destruction. Each explosion of a civilian ship echoed across both fleets, reinforcing the disparity in their values. From the debris of what were once vessels filled with hope, Carvon's gaze shifted to Zorvan's fleet. Their formation was now disrupted, their synchronized movement slightly more frantic, and the damage was evident. Several Federation ships trailed smoke, their hulls scarred and their movements sluggish. Count the cost, Carvon murmured to himself, though his words reached the ears of his officers. This is the price they pay. Yerkai nodded, eyes never leaving the battlefield. They were unprepared for our response. Their audacity will be their downfall. But even as the Drac fleet seemed to revel in their tactical advantage, Carvin's strategic mind was already at work. The Federation's audacious assault had been a lesson, one he wouldn't forget. They were formidable, capable of innovation on the fly. They had guts. And yet, even as he acknowledged their skill, Carvon felt a surge of confidence. The Federation, for all their valor, were still driven by emotion. Their protective stance around the civilian crafts had been their undoing. For the Drac, war was pure calculus, and emotions had no place in it. Slowly, the tide of battle began to shift unmistakably in favor of the Drac. As the intensity of the Federation's return fire waned, it became evident that Zorvan's ships were beginning a strategic withdrawal. Carvon watched their retreat with a mix of satisfaction and anticipation. The Federation had demonstrated they were a force to be reckoned with, but today, the universe had been reminded of the Drac's unparalleled might. Staring out into the vastness, Carvon felt a strange sensation, something he hadn't experienced in many battles. Respect. Respect for an adversary who could challenge the Drac, push them to adapt, and fight with such determination. But as the last of Zorvan's ships disappeared into the abyss, Carvon's reptilian eyes shimmered with confidence. This war was far from over, but the Drac's eventual victory was, in his mind, a foregone conclusion. The once turbulent expanse of space now settled into an eerie quietude. Zorvan's fleet had retreated, their luminous trails slowly fading from sight. But the shadows they left behind lingered, casting doubt upon a theater that the Drac had considered their own. Orinthia, a radiant gem among the constellations, once again emerged as the central focus of Carvon's intentions. Yet the encounter with the Federation fleet left an indelible imprint on his strategic cortex. We detect an accumulation of Federation forces, Commander, said one of his tactical officers, breaking the contemplative silence. The officer's eyes were fixed on a screen showcasing a matrix of dots, each symbolizing a potential threat. Recommendation. We pursue and engage before they can consolidate. Carvon considered the suggestion, memories of the skirmish fresh in his mind. He had seen many commanders in his lifetime, but few, if any, had shown the audacity and tactical acumen of Zorvan. To engage without fully understanding this newfound adversary would be reckless. No. Carvon's voice was firm but contemplative. We will not pursue. Realign the fleet and restart the bombardment of Orinthia from orbit. The inhabitants must know the consequence of Federation interference. His officer looked puzzled. Commander, with respect, we have the upper hand now. Why wait? Carvon's gaze didn't waver from the looming specter of Orinthia. Because, Lieutenant, the game has changed, and to underestimate an opponent, especially one as resourceful as Zorvan, would be folly. There it was, a sentiment that Carvon had rarely felt, let alone voiced respect. He had witnessed Zorvan's ability to galvanize a fleet, to instill hope even in the face of devastating odds. This wasn't just about ships and firepower. It was a battle of minds, and Carvon recognized that their next clash would not be so straightforward.
As hours melded into each other, Carvon's chamber became a haven of reflection. Battle simulations ran on holographic screens, displaying possible scenarios of their next encounter with the Federation. But beyond these projections, Carvon wrestled with deeper contemplations. Gone were the days where the Drac could simply impose their will without resistance. The galaxy was evolving, and if they didn't adapt, they risked being left behind. For all their technological prowess and disciplined tactics, the emotional tenacity of the Federation was a factor they couldn't ignore. The chamber's large observation window offered a panorama of the cosmos. Stars twinkled, nebulas swirled in colorful dances, and planets orbited in harmonious patterns. It was a tapestry of existence, and the Drac's role within it was becoming increasingly complex. Deep in thought, Carvon pondered the paths the universe could take. Each choice, each battle, every strategy could tip the scales in unforeseen ways. He held an unwavering belief in the Drac's destiny to reign supreme. Yet a nagging voice reminded him that complacency could be the downfall of even the mightiest. The weight of the galaxy's fate rested heavily upon him. The intertwining fates of the Drac, the Federation, Orinthia, and countless other entities hung in the balance. This wasn't just about conquest, it was about survival, legacy, and the future. With the vast expanse of space stretching before him, Carvon's silhouette stood as a testament to the challenges ahead. This chapter in the galaxy's history was just beginning, and the Drac, with Carvon at the helm, would need more than sheer might to navigate the tumultuous waters ahead. He knew that underestimating the Federation and, more importantly, Zorvan, could spell a catastrophe they might not recover from. And so the universe watched, waited, and whispered of battles yet to come. The vastness of space, with its countless mysteries and infinite darkness, is occasionally pierced by wonders, and as the Federation fleet emerged from warp, such a wonder revealed itself. Ahead of them was a star, a radiant blue sun that bathed the vicinity in a cool azure hue. It was a sight to behold, but it was just the prologue to the marvels that awaited them. Elira, the Helian ambassador to the Federation, piloted her sleek Helian vessel at the forefront of the fleet. From the emblematic design of her ship, it was evident it represented the Helians' aesthetic sensibilities and their technological prowess. Through the communication channel, Elira's calm voice resonated on the bridge of the Federation flagship, the Star Strider, where Captain Jorvis listened intently. She had been instrumental in orchestrating this rendezvous, driven by an earnest desire to fortify the fledgling alliance between the Helians and the Federation. Captain Jorvis gazed out of the main viewport, the radiance of the blue sun reflecting in his eyes. Magnificent, he murmured, admiring the luminosity that spread across space. Elira, with a hint of pride, responded, It's known as Lyrian Prime, one of the oldest stars in our domain, and home to the Helian shipyards. She pointed forward as a series of structures began to emerge from the blue shimmer, orbiting the star in synchronous harmony. And then they saw them, two behemoth Helian battlecruisers, hovering gracefully near the shipyards. The cruisers were majestic, with sweeping lines and glowing energy conduits. Their size and design made the Federation ships accompanying the Star Strider seem almost juvenile in comparison. Jorvis let out a low whistle. I knew the Helians were advanced, but seeing these battle cruisers, it's humbling. Ilira nodded, her silver eyes reflecting the radiant ships. They are the pinnacle of Helian engineering, Captain, designed for both defense and scientific exploration. But they are not just instruments of war. They are symbols of our culture's dedication to knowledge and unity. The proximity alert softly chimed, signaling their approach to the docking stations. Elira instructed, Prepare for docking procedures. The Helian shipyards have allocated bays for each of your ships. Captain Jorvis turned to his crew, issuing a series of crisp commands to ensure a smooth transition into the docking phase. Helmsman, align us with the designated bay. Communications, keep channels open with the shipyard's control. As the Federation fleet began their synchronized descent into the allocated docking bays, crew members from both sides prepared for the exchange of knowledge and technology that would follow. Elira, sensing the weight of the moment, turned to Jorvis. Our worlds have faced many challenges, Captain. But here, in the haven of Lyrian Prime, we find hope. 
The alliance between the Federation and the Helians is more than just strategy. It's a testament to the fact that when civilizations come together, they can achieve wonders. Jorvis, always the pragmatic leader, gave her a nod of understanding and respect. Ambassador, once our ships are docked and secure, I'd like to convene with my captains. We need to understand the extent of these upgrades and how best to integrate them into our systems. Of course, Illyra agreed. I'll also have our chief scientist join us. We want this transition to be seamless. As the Star Strider settled into its berth, the sense of anticipation was palpable. Ahead lay a period of transformation where the might of two civilizations would merge in defense of a shared future. The blue sun, Lyrian Prime, stood sentinel in the background, a beacon of hope in the ever-evolving theater of interstellar politics. Promise of power. The Helian shipyard was a sight to behold. Arcing structures made of shimmering alloys, multi-layered platforms hovering in void, and intricate patterns of energy grids painted a breathtaking tableau of an advanced civilization's pinnacle of achievement. It was here that Elyra's ship docked, leading the Federation vessels into a designated formation. Captain Jorvis, along with other Federation ship captains, disembarked from their ships onto a floating platform that adjusted itself to the ship's heights. Their boots made a soft thud on the cerulean surface, which hummed with a quiet energy. Elira, from her own ship, gestured for the group to follow her. Welcome to the Helian Core shipyard, she announced, her voice echoing softly. You're about to meet our chief scientist, Dr. Thalian. His team has been preparing for your arrival. The captains exchanged glances, sensing the gravity of this meeting. They followed Elira into a vast, domed chamber, its walls lined with glowing glyphs and holographic displays showcasing complex schematics. At the chamber's center stood a tall Helian figure, flanked by an entourage of aides and technicians. His piercing eyes surveyed the newcomers as Elira introduced him. Captains, this is Dr. Thelian, our chief scientist and the architect of our fleet's technological prowess. Dr. Thelian stepped forward, nodding. Elira has briefed me on the situation. The stakes have never been higher. Let us not waste time. His voice had a timbre of both authority and deep-seated wisdom. With a gesture, a massive holographic display emerged from the floor, showcasing a Federation ship and its internal systems. He began, Your phasers will receive a significant upgrade. We're looking at a 200% power increase. The hologram zoomed in on the phaser arrays, illustrating the modifications. In addition, our proprietary cooling technology will ensure that they maintain a higher rate of fire, allowing you a 50% increase in sustained combat engagements. As the captains murmured among themselves, the display shifted to the ship's shield systems. Our shield emitters operate on a different harmonic spectrum. They can cycle through frequencies at a rapid rate, dispersing the energy from DRAC phaser fire more efficiently. Your vessels will have a greater damage tolerance, enabling prolonged engagements without compromising structural integrity. Jorvis raised a hand. And the torpedoes? Dr. Thelian smiled, a hint of pride evident. Ah, one of our proudest achievements. The torpedoes will have upgraded navigation systems and an increased yield. But what truly sets them apart is the advanced AI. These torpedoes will anticipate and counteract DRAC defensive measures, increasing evasion response times, and ensuring a higher impact rate. The atmosphere in the room was electric. The weight of the Helian's contribution to their cause was palpable. But it wasn't just the technology, it was the willingness of the Helians to share their expertise and train the Federation engineers. Captain Jorvis nodded, absorbing the information. This is beyond what we had hoped for, but what's the time frame? Dr. Thelian's expression became more solemn. Given the complexities, we estimate a 30-day window for completion. The room went silent. 30 days in the galactic scheme of things wasn't long, especially given the scope of the upgrades. Yet, with the Drac threat looming large, every moment counted. Elira stepped forward, sensing the captain's apprehensions. We understand the urgency of the situation. Our teams will work around the clock to ensure timely completion. But rest assured, while time is of the essence, quality and precision won't be compromised. Captain Jorvis met her gaze, determination shining in his eyes. With these upgrades, Alira, I can't wait to take the fight straight to the Drac. As the meeting adjourned, the Federation captains left with a renewed sense of hope. The galaxy was on the brink, 
But with allies like the Helians, there was a glimmer of hope, a promise of power, disturbing dispatches. The Helian shipyard, awash in the glow of the luminous blue sun, was a scene of frenzied activity. Federation ships were carefully maneuvered into docking berths. Helian engineers consulted their Federation counterparts, and in the midst of it all, the echo of the monumental briefing still hung in the air. The promise of power was tangible, and every captain, every crew member felt it. But space, vast and unpredictable, has a way of disrupting the best laid plans. On board the Star Strider, Captain Jorvis and his senior crew had barely settled back into their routines when the communication console lit up with the insignia of the Federation. It wasn't just any communication, it was flagged as high priority. An icy spike of dread wormed its way into Jorvis's gut. Jorvis, instantly alert, signaled to open the channel. The screen flickered to life, showing both Admiral Krell and Elyra on a joint call. Admiral Krell, his face normally stern, now bore lines of strain and exhaustion. His voice, when he spoke, carried the weight of decisions made under fire. Captain Jorvis. Admiral Krell's voice was filled with urgency. There have been significant developments on the front. The Admiral recounted the confrontation. Zorvin's initial success in heavily damaging a Drac behemoth. The Drac's ruthless counter resulting in the destruction of two Federation ships and the strategic retreat to link up with the fleet. The bridge was silent, each officer grappling with the implications of what they'd just heard. Orinthia was critical. The Drac's encroachment into Federation space was bolder and more aggressive than they'd anticipated. Alira's usually serene face looked troubled. We've been apprised of the situation as well. This council was initiated to ensure that both our peoples are in alignment. Jorvis found his voice. Admiral, what are our next steps? We regroup, assess, and retaliate. Zorvin's fleet is en route to rendezvous with our main battle group. Every ship, every crew member needs to be ready. Jorvis nodded, processing the information. I wish I could help, Admiral. But I know the work we're doing here is important to turn the tide. Elira interjected. Our involvement in this conflict is no longer that of mere observers. Now, as allies, it's time we act. As already agreed, if a little ahead of schedule, we're dispatching two of our battle cruisers to bolster your defenses against the Drac. Jorvis's eyes widened. Those Helian ships were technological marvels. Their mere presence would be a massive boon to the Federation's battle capabilities. Krell's face showed a mix of surprise and gratitude. Your support changes the tides, Ambassador. The Federation is in your debt. Krell leaned forward. If I might request, having a contingent of Federation personnel aboard the Helian battle cruisers would symbolize our joint venture against this threat. Elira considered this for a moment before nodding. It shall be done. Let it be a testament to the unity of our civilizations. However, Elira's voice took on a note of caution. Due to our current location, it will take the battle cruisers seven days to reach the main conflict zone. Krell nodded. Understood. We'll prepare for their arrival. As the communication ended, Captain Jorvis looked out at the vast expanse, filled with a renewed sense of hope. The promise of the Helian battle cruisers offered a glimmer of hope in an otherwise dire situation. Yet as Jorvis gazed out into the vast expanse of space, he knew that in war, time was the most elusive ally, and seven days could change the fate of the galaxy. Shadows and decisions. The vast void of space was a deceptive realm. It often seemed serene and silent, but those who navigated its depths knew better. Deep within Drac territory, the small stealth ship, agile and nearly invisible to conventional sensors, cut its path through the cold expanse. It was a ship caught between the unseen hammer of the Drac and the anvil of time. Inside, the tension was palpable. After making several small FTL jumps to random locations to ensure the Drac couldn't trail them, the atmosphere aboard the stealth ship grew tense. The group, having ensured their temporary safety, was now faced with the pressing decision of their next move. Their cloak shielded them, but it wasn't a guarantee. The Drac were clever, resourceful, and their territory was vast. They could emerge from anywhere, anytime. A fact Rice kept pointing out as he studied the star charts. We need to get back to the Federation. It's the logical move, Rice insisted, fingers dancing across the console, plotting potential routes. Lyra nodded in agreement. I've been in more close calls than I care to admit, Prince. 
Heading deeper into enemy territory isn't one I'm keen to add to the list. Prince Arlen stood at the main viewport, his gaze distant, fixed on the swirling nebulas and distant star clusters. My people. Those who escaped. They're out there, still resisting. I can't abandon them. Not now. His voice was a blend of determination and despair. Lithia, always the voice of reason, tried to bridge the gap. Arlon, no one's suggesting that. But perhaps there's a middle path. We get to the rebels, share what we know, and then make our way to the Federation with more numbers, more strength. Arlen turned to face them, the weight of a world on his shoulders evident in his eyes. You don't understand. Those rebels are more than just survivors. They're symbols. Symbols of resistance, of hope. We can't let them down. Rice exhaled, running a hand through his hair. Look, I get it. The drive to stand by your people, especially in their darkest hours. But what good are we to them if we get caught before we even reach them? The prince walked over to the console, fingers skimming over the holographic projections. Here. He pointed to a cluster of stars. This is where we last made contact. If they're still out there, it's here. Lyra squinted at the map. That's the Viserian Nebula. It's dense. Sensors would be unreliable. It could offer us cover. And risk, Rice added. But there was no venom in his voice, just wearied realism. A heavy silence filled the cabin. Each person lost in their thoughts weighed the risks, the rewards, the values they held dearest. The very essence of their mission was alliances, unity, and collective defiance. A realization that in a universe where threats like the Drac existed, divides were a luxury none could afford. Lithia broke the silence. We stand together then, to the rebels first, then, with added strength, to the Federation. Arlon looked gratefully at his companions. Thank you. Rice, despite his reservations, smirked. Well, let's just hope your rebels have good food. With a shared chuckle lightening the atmosphere, the coordinates were set. The stealth ship, a silent testament to hope, resilience, and the collective spirit, warped into the embrace of the nebula and the promises it held. The vastness of space enveloped the scene as the stars themselves seemed to watch with bated breath. Emerging from the nebulous shimmer of a nearby star cluster, the sleek, battle-worn forms of Zorvan's four ships appeared. Their engines hummed with a subdued power, their metal skins adorned with the scars of recent combat. As they approached the formidable formation of the Eighth Fleet, a myriad of beacons lit up, signaling their safe docking trajectories. Across the vast array of the Eighth Fleet's vessels, bridge crews stared in awe at the hollow screens. The images of Zorvan's ships bore testament to their fierce encounters with the Drac. The very fact that they had emerged from such a confrontation was enough to send murmurs of admiration rippling through the ranks. On the flagship of the Eighth Fleet, Captain Hale adjusted his cap and whispered to his first officer, That's the ship that took on a Drac behemoth and lived to tell the tale. The first officer, a grizzled veteran named Hark, nodded. Zorvan's got the touch of the ancients, never seen anything quite like it. Indeed, similar exchanges took place across the fleet. Communications channels buzzed with a mix of speculation and awe. Tales of Zorvan's audacity, his tactical genius, and above all, his unyielding courage were shared and reshared, growing in grandeur with each retelling. A broadcast signal bearing Zorvan's insignia soon pierced the ambient chatter. The deep, resonant voice of the revered commander filled every vessel's communication system. Captains of the Eighth Fleet, this is General Zorvan. We have much to discuss. I request your presence aboard my ship for a strategy debrief. The response was almost immediate. One by one, affirmations from captains poured in. General Zorvan, Captain Hale of the Star Vanguard, we are at your service. Another chimed in. This is Captain Wren of the Nebula Guard. It'll be an honor to stand with you. And so it continued. A chorus of captains expressing their respect and readiness. On Zorvan's ship, the crew prepared the conference room. The large round table gleamed under the overhead lights, surrounded by seats equipped with data terminals. At the head of the table, a larger terminal was set up, no doubt for Zorvan himself. As the captains began to arrive via transport shuttles, the airlock chamber became a melting pot of Federation uniforms. The various insignias and badges told tales of battles fought and victories won. 
Yet as each captain stepped onto Zorvan's ship, there was a shared sentiment. Respect for the man who had, against all odds, given the Drac pause. Greeting each captain personally, Zorvan nodded, exchanged a few words, and ensured everyone felt acknowledged. This wasn't just about strategy. It was about unity. As Captain Hale approached, he extended his hand. General, your deeds are already the stuff of legends. We stand with you. Zorvan, his face bearing the weight of the recent battle but eyes alight with a fierce determination, nodded. Thank you, Captain. Today we unite as one fleet, one force. Together we'll write the next chapter of this legend. The chamber soon filled with the murmurs of discussions, anticipation for the debrief, and the shared camaraderie of warriors ready to face a common foe. The stage was set for Zorvan's next move, and every soul aboard his ship felt it. History was in the making. The debrief. The Grand Conference Room on Zorvan's ship was awash with captains from all corners of the Federation. Its circular shape, with a massive view screen on one side and tiers of seats, made it reminiscent of ancient amphitheaters. Every seat was occupied, with the assembled captains leaning forward in anticipation. The room dimmed and the view screen came to life, displaying the imposing figure of Admiral Krell. He sat in his command chair on the bridge of the Federation's primary command ship, the great star expanse stretching out behind him. The iconic silver beard and steely eyes of Krell commanded immediate respect. Captains of the Eighth Fleet, we gather under the most dire of circumstances, yet also with a ray of hope. This ray of hope has been ignited by General Zorvan and his crew. He paused, emotion evident in his eyes. But it's with a heavy heart that we also remember the brave souls who paid the ultimate price in the recent encounter. Their memories will fuel our fight, and their sacrifice will not be in vain. A somber moment of silence washed over the room as the weight of the Admiral's words sank in. Zorvan then stepped forward, the room's lights illuminating him. He stood tall, his posture radiating authority and confidence. Thank you, Admiral. Captains, our encounter with the Drac revealed several crucial insights. Insights that may very well turn the tide in our favor. He activated a hollow projector, and a three-dimensional recreation of the recent battle with the Drac came to life. Ships darted about, with Zorvan providing a detailed narration of each strategic move. As we approached the Drax behemoth, he said, zooming in on a segment of the battle, we noted their initial overconfidence. It was only when we pressed our advantage and hit them where they least expected that we saw a shift. The Drac commander is no ordinary foe. They're cunning, adaptive, and incredibly resourceful. Zorvan continued, highlighting the Drac strategies, their feints, and more importantly, the moments when the Drac forces seemed uncertain or reactive. It was a dance of strategies, and while the Drac had the upper hand in sheer firepower, Zorvan's tactics had introduced an element of unpredictability. Here. Zorvan pointed to a moment where the Drac behemoth unleashed a massive energy pulse. Was our revelation. The Drac rely heavily on this energy signature. While devastating, it also has a pattern, a rhythm. If we can disrupt this rhythm, even momentarily, we can exploit a potential weakness. Murmurs spread across the room. Captain Hale leaned in, curiosity evident on his face. Are you suggesting we can jam or interfere with their primary weapon system? Zorvan nodded. Exactly. Our engineers have already begun working on a potential countermeasure. If successful, it could grant us a significant advantage. Admiral Krell, listening intently, interjected. This could be the game-changer, but it won't be easy. The Drac won't sit idly by. You're right, Admiral, Zorvan affirmed. But we've been on the defensive for too long. It's time we shift the narrative. With this potential weakness, and the combined might and wit of the Eighth Fleet, we have a fighting chance. Krell nodded approvingly. General Zorvan, you've given us hope in these dark times. The Federation stands by you. Zorvan saluted. We stand together, Admiral. Together we'll reclaim our galaxy. The mood in the room had changed. From the sorrow of loss, a new fire was kindled. The fire of determination, the desire to turn the tables, and the hope of a future free from the shadow of the Drac. Planning and realization. With the assembled captains now wrapped with anticipation, Zorvan moved to the next phase of the briefing. The room's main table projected a holographic map of Aurelian Prime and its surrounding space. 
Every captain leaned forward, eyes darting across the display as Zorvan initiated the next segment of his presentation. Captains, he began, his voice authoritative. The Drac are formidable, yes, but not invincible. Our battle plan needs to capitalize on their weaknesses while leveraging our combined strength. A series of ship icons appeared on the projection, each representing the vessels of the Eighth Fleet. Zorvan proceeded to intricately detail each ship's role. The lighter, nimble ships, Zorvan gestured to a group of icons, will engage in swift hit-and-run tactics designed to disorient the Drac. Captain Hale, your ship, along with the others in this squadron, will focus on their flank. Hale nodded, making a mental note. He then highlighted another cluster. Our heavier ships will form the central phalanx. Their job will be to draw the Drac's fire, allowing our lighter vessels the room to maneuver and strike. It was a dance of strategy and tactics, each piece in its place working in unison. Zorvan continued, Unity is our strength. If even one ship falters or strays from the plan, it could compromise the entire operation. Our cohesion, our trust in one another, that will be our defining advantage. A series of approving nods and murmurs echoed through the room. The captains were seasoned veterans, each having faced the drac in varying capacities. Yet the comprehensive nature of Zorvan's plan offered a newfound confidence. However, as the momentum of the briefing reached its peak, Admiral Krell's image on the view screen stiffened. General Zorvan, he began, his tone heavy with an underlying concern. Before we proceed, there's pertinent information regarding the Helian reinforcements and the technological upgrades. Zorvan nodded, indicating for the Admiral to continue. The Helian battlecruisers have been dispatched, but their estimated time of arrival is seven days. Krell paused, letting the information settle. The technological upgrades for our fleet, crucial as they are, will take approximately 30 days to complete. The weight of the revelation hung in the air like a thick fog. The math was simple and grim. The impending battle against the Drac would have to be faced without the might of the Helian battlecruisers and without the advanced upgrades. A tide of whispered concerns swept through the conference room. Zorvan, sensing the shift in mood, stepped forward, addressing the group with unwavering resolve. We knew this battle wouldn't be easy. The Drac have always had a numerical and technological advantage, but they lack what we have, unity, determination, and the element of surprise. His eyes scanned the room, meeting the gaze of each captain. We have a plan, a solid plan. The Helian support would have been advantageous, yes, but we cannot and will not rely solely on external factors. Our strength comes from within, from our combined experience, our collective wisdom, and our unyielding spirit. Admiral Krell, visibly impressed by Zorvan's leadership, added, General Zorvan is right. We faced dire situations before. With strategy, courage, and determination, we've emerged victorious. This battle will be no different. The room grew silent, with each captain absorbing the words, recalibrating their mindset. It was a palpable shift from apprehension back to determination. Zorvan concluded, Return to your ships, brief your crews, and prepare for battle. We move with the knowledge that the entire Federation is behind us. Together we'll ensure the Drac regret ever crossing our path. It was a statement, a promise, and a rallying cry. The unity of the fleet was more crucial than ever. Urgency and departure. Just as the gathering was about to disperse, an urgent, beeping alert resonated through Zorvan's ship, instantly arresting everyone's attention. A communications officer's voice echoed into the conference room, breaking the charged silence. General Zorvan, our Helian gravimetric sensors have picked up four incoming Drac vessels on a direct course for Aurelian Prime. Estimated time of arrival, 12 hours. The mood, already dense with the weight of the previous revelations, grew heavier. Zorvan's sharp eyes scanned the captains, gauging their reactions. A medley of concern, determination, and resolve was evident in their expressions. Before uncertainty could take root, Zorvan stepped forward, his voice unwavering. Captains, the Drac's premature arrival only underscores the importance of our mission. It also means they might not be expecting our full force to face them head on. We have a strategic advantage. The room was silent, save for the hum of the ship's machinery. The captains waited, anticipating Zorvan's next move. We knew this battle wouldn't be won with ease. Every moment, every decision counts, Zorvan continued. 
Our swift response will be paramount. The Drac think they're making a surprise move. It's our turn to surprise them. Captain Hale, taking a moment from the weight of the news, stepped forward, his voice echoing the sentiment of the entire fleet. General, we trust in your leadership and strategy. The Eighth Fleet stands united. Aurelian Prime will not fall on our watch. Zorvan nodded in acknowledgement. Your trust is well placed, Captain. Return to your ships, rally your crews, and prepare for engagement. We depart in one hour. Every ship, every crew member plays a vital role. With determination renewed, the captains saluted Zorvan and began making their way out of the conference room. Their steps were swift, the urgency of the situation evident in every movement. As the captains dispersed, Zorvan sent out a broadcast to the entire fleet. To all ships of the 8th Fleet, this is General Zorvan. Our resolve, our unity will be tested in the coming hours. The Drac seek to undermine our efforts, but will stand as one, delivering a decisive blow. Our strategy, our unity, and our sheer will shall be our shield and weapon. Let's purge Aurelian Prime of the Drac menace and send a resounding message to the galaxy. We are the Federation, and we will prevail. Across the fleet, crew members went about their duties with renewed vigor, carrying out final checks and battle preparations. The stars themselves seemed to shimmer with anticipation, the vastness of space bearing witness to the impending confrontation. And as the Eighth Fleet began aligning into formation for departure, a breathtaking scene unfolded several light years away. The Helian shipyards, Lyrian Prime, a jewel amidst the vast cosmic landscape, bore witness to the awe-inspiring departure of its two mightiest battlecruisers. Their sleek and formidable forms glided effortlessly, luminous against the backdrop of space. As they engaged their FTL drives, brilliant streaks of light marked their trajectory, setting the stage for their eventual and inevitable clash with the Drac. The universe, with its countless stars and galaxies, was now a theater of war, where destinies would be forged, legends birthed, and the future of entire civilizations decided. The Calm Before the Storm from where I sat on the bridge, space stretched out before me like an endless canvas, painted in the deepest shade of midnight. Little pinpricks of light, stars from far-off galaxies, were the only things that kept this vast sea from being a void of impenetrable darkness. Among them, faintly shimmering like treacherous mirages in the desert, were the Drac behemoths. As I looked at them, a knot of anxiety tightened in my chest. But this wasn't just about Orinthia or my own pride. The weight on my shoulders was far heavier than that. This was about every planet, every being, every soul that called the Federation home. I could feel the very essence of our union, our camaraderie, our shared dreams, and our collective willpower. We had lived in harmony, championing the values of freedom and unity, and these behemoths threatened to shatter it all. I tried to steady my breathing, drawing in the cold, sterile air of the ship's bridge. My fingers tapped lightly against the armrest of my command chair, a rhythm of uncertainty. There was something deeply unnerving about the calmness, about the stillness of this moment. It felt like the world held its breath, waiting for the storm that was about to unfold. Suddenly, the contemplative silence was interrupted by a series of beeps, the signals, proximity alerts indicating the Drac fleet was nearing our position. A glance at the tactical display confirmed their approach, their massive signatures impossible to miss. The reality of the confrontation ahead came crashing down on me. This wasn't just another skirmish or a routine patrol encounter. This was war, and I had to lead the Federation's defense. Taking a deep breath, I stood up from my chair, feeling its cold embrace leave my back. All hands, I announced, my voice resonating throughout the ship, prepare for engagement. I took a moment to look around the bridge, locking eyes with each of my officers. They too understood the gravity of the situation. But there was also a spark in their eyes, a fire that reflected determination, trust, and an unwavering belief in our cause. Gathering myself, I continued, I won't lie to you. What lies ahead will test us in ways we've never imagined. We face an enemy that's relentless, cunning, and unlike any other. But remember, we are the Federation. We've faced adversity before and emerged stronger each time. Today will be no different. I paused, letting my words sink in. The Drac may have numbers, they may have behemoths, 
But we have something they'll never understand. Unity. We fight not as separate ships, not as individuals, but as a collective, bound by a shared purpose. We fight for our homes, for our loved ones, and for the values that define us. A chorus of affirmations rang out across the bridge, echoing my sentiments. We engage on my mark, I declared, feeling the rush of adrenaline. Positions everyone, and may the stars guide us to victory. The vastness of space that once felt daunting now felt like an arena, a stage where our destiny would be decided. The calm was about to give way to the storm, and I, Zorvan, would lead the charge. The opening salvo. The vastness of space became alive with motion and energy, as our ships, like orchestrated dancers, took their designated positions. From my command post, I could oversee this dance, a deadly ballet in the theater of war. The humming of the engines, the soft glow of our shield generators, the chatter of commanders over the comms, it was all an elaborate symphony before the storm. There it was, the previously damaged Drac ship from our last dance. It had a distinct scar, a cruel reminder of the damage we inflicted, and a testament to its resilience. But that very scar also marked its vulnerability, making it the prime target for our opening salvo. Lock on to the damaged behemoth, I ordered crisply, the memory of our last encounter flashing briefly in my mind. We strike where they're weak, and we strike hard. My tactical officer, Commander Thess, quickly responded, Target locked, General. Awaiting your command. The ship's weapon systems hummed with lethal potential. I could feel it, the power, the anticipation, the rush of leading the charge. As we approached, every second felt elongated, a mix of anxiety and excitement. Fire! The word escaped my lips, echoing with determination. The space around us erupted into a brilliant display of energy beams, projectiles, and roaring engines. Our ships moved in a coordinated assault, striking the damaged Drac behemoth from multiple angles. Each hit was a symphony of light and force, and with every impact, I felt a surge of hope. The climax came in a blinding burst of light as the ship's core detonated. An exhilarating sensation coursed through me, watching the behemoth fracture into countless pieces. The sight of that once imposing vessel being reduced to cosmic dust was a spectacle, one that I hoped would echo across the galaxy. The bridge erupted in cheers. The initial victory, the first blow had been dealt, and it was ours. I allowed myself a moment, just a fleeting one, to savor the triumph. But amidst the celebration, my strategic mind kicked in, analyzing the situation and weighing the challenges that lay ahead. Four more behemoths loomed in the distance, their menacing silhouettes stark against the backdrop of Orinthia. Steady, crew, I voiced, letting the weight of my words dampen the premature elation. That was just the first. We have more adversaries ahead, and we need to be prepared. Looking out, I saw the remaining Drac behemoths adjusting their formation, clearly realizing the threat we posed. They were not to be underestimated. Their colossal size, their advanced tech, and their ruthless tactics made them formidable adversaries. But we had something they didn't. Unity, strategy, and the heart of the Federation beating within each of us. We took down one, I said with resolve, addressing the crew. We can and will take down the rest. All ships adjust formation. Let's employ the jamming strategy on their primary weapons. Commander Thess, ready the interference pulse. The battle had only just begun, and while we had drawn the first blood, the real challenge lay ahead. Yet with every strike, every maneuver, and every decision, I was reminded of the strength and unity of the Federation fleet. As the distance between us and the remaining Drac behemoths closed, I knew this would be a battle for the ages. A defining moment not just for me, Zorvan, but for the entire Federation. The heart of the battle. The vastness of space became an intricate chessboard, and as the Federation fleet danced in deadly synchrony with the Drac behemoths, each move was a calculated gambit. The darkness lit up with the iridescence of energy beams and explosions, painting a macabre tapestry of war. I leaned forward, my eyes scanning the battlefield, absorbing every detail every movement. Deploy the jamming device on their primary weapon systems, I ordered, hoping to exploit the vulnerability we had recently uncovered. As the device was launched, a tense silence settled over the bridge. We all waited with bated breath, hoping for even a momentary lapse in the Drac's formidable offense. The initial results were promising, 
the pulsating energy from the jammer causing a brief interruption in their firing sequence. We have a window. All ships, focus fire on the second behemoth's left flank, I commanded, seizing the moment. The fleet responded with unmatched precision, beams converging on the targeted area. But space battles are seldom straightforward. The jammer's effect began to wane faster than anticipated, and soon the Drax weapon systems roared back to life. I felt a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach as a brilliant beam from one of the behemoths pierced through the void and struck one of our cruisers. The resulting explosion was both mesmerizing and heart-wrenching. Evacuate the ship, I screamed, hoping against hope that some could be saved from the doomed vessel. Every loss stung deeply, a sharp reminder of the price of this war. But amidst the chaos and despair, moments of hope shone through. Intercepted Drac communications revealed their surprise and frustration. They hadn't expected this level of resistance, and it was clear our strategies were taking a toll. A smirk formed on my lips. We have them rattled. Stay the course and maintain formation. Let's give them a fight they'll never forget. With renewed vigor, the fleet pressed on, making strategic advances and retreats. As ships darted about, leaving streaks of light in their wake, I found myself constantly adapting, rethinking strategies on the fly. My tactical overlay became a frenzied dance of shifting vectors and projected outcomes. Amidst the turmoil, a voice broke through, General, we've punched through the defenses of the third behemoth. I looked up just in time to see a series of torpedoes striking the behemoth's core. It erupted in a brilliant display, a sun born and extinguished in mere moments. Another behemoth down, but at what cost? The debris from the explosion impacted two of our frigates, causing significant damage. Breathing heavily, I gripped the armrests of my command chair. The tide was turning, but this battle was far from over. Each victory was paired with a bitter reminder of its cost. We push on, I whispered to myself, unwilling to let despair take root. We had come too far, lost too much to waver now. All ships regroup and prepare for another strike. We have the momentum. Let's keep it. As the Federation fleet reformed its lines, I took a moment to reflect. I felt the weight of every decision, every command. But there was also a fire within, a resolve forged from battles past, and the hope of a future free from the shadow of the Drac. In the midst of the swirling chaos of battle, I remained a beacon for the fleet, guiding them through the storm, ever onward, ever forward. The final push. The vast expanse around us crackled with energy, residual shockwaves of our fierce combat against the Drac. With two behemoths still threatening, I knew it was time to employ a tactic I'd been holding in reserve. Focus all available firepower on the nearest behemoth. I commanded, my voice steely, then use the EMP charges. The bridge crew exchanged glances, surprised. We had rarely used EMP in open space combat due to its unpredictable nature, but desperate times called for desperate measures. I could sense the unspoken question from the crew. Are we sure about this? But trust prevailed. They had seen the odds we had overcome so far. The first salvo of fire was a sight to behold. Federation ships moving in orchestrated patterns unleashed a barrage on the Drac behemoth, targeting its weak points. As the behemoth reeled from the assault, a squadron of our fighters swooped in, dropping the EMP charges right onto its exposed sections. The resulting electromagnetic pulse sent a cascading shock through the behemoth, causing it to falter and go dark. A hush of disbelief fell over the bridge. It had worked. Press the advantage. All ships fire at will, I shouted. The behemoth, devoid of its shields, was soon consumed in a storm of explosions, fragmenting into countless pieces that glittered like a deadly rain. Cheers erupted around me, but my eyes were fixed on the last behemoth. It too had seen the fate of its kin and was now making hasty preparations. It's trying to make a jump to hyperspace, my navigation officer warned. We couldn't let it escape. The knowledge it carried, the strategies it had witnessed could arm the Drac with valuable intel. All available units, intercept and disable its jump drives, I bellowed. What ensued was a frenzied race against time. Squadrons zoomed towards the behemoth, dodging its defensive fire and trying to get close enough to deliver crippling shots to its engines. Every moment stretched, seconds feeling like hours. On the view screen, the behemoth's engines glowed brighter, signaling its imminent departure. No, I whispered, 
feeling the weight of the situation. If it escaped, our victory, as monumental as it was, would be overshadowed by the implications of a behemoth carrying our tactics back to the DRAC reinforcements. And then, in a flash of light and energy, the behemoth was gone, vanished into the ether of hyperspace. The bridge, moments ago a hubbub of activity, sank into a heavy silence. We had won the day, but at a cost. I took a deep breath, feeling the weight of the galaxy on my shoulders. Record the battle data, analyze the jump vector. We need to be prepared for what's coming next, I said with a solemn tone. Celebratory cheers from the fleet's communication channels echoed around us. We had achieved a significant victory, but the war was far from over. The lone escaping behemoth would surely relay our tactics to the Drac War Council, making our future encounters even more challenging. But for now, amidst the debris of a hard-fought battle, there was a moment of triumph, a brief respite for the brave souls of the 8th Federation fleet. Looking out into the vastness of space, the stars beyond twinkling with distant promise, I felt a mix of pride and trepidation. The universe awaited, and we had sent a clear message. The Federation would stand tall, no matter the odds. Several light years away, near the fringes of the Viserian Nebula, the stealth ship charted its course. While Zorvan and the Eighth Fleet were locked in their celestial dance with the Drac behemoths, here on the other side of known space, a different story was unfolding, one of secrecy, resilience, and a desperate hope. As the ship skirted the edges of the Viserian Nebula, a soft pink and gold hue painted the vast canvas of space, casting ephemeral shadows within the ship's cabin. The nebula's density scattered their sensors, causing the displays to flicker with distorted readings. Lyra focused intently on the engines, ensuring the stealth drive remained optimal. You sure about these coordinates, Arlen? She questioned, her eyes never leaving her console. They were accurate when last we spoke, Arlon responded, his tone even, but the underlying anxiety was unmistakable. Rice, hands firmly gripping the ship's controls, maneuvered the vessel with precision, each turn and twist designed to elude potential drac patrols. It's quiet, he murmured, too quiet. Lithia, immersing herself in old communication records, looked up. I've intercepted a faint transmission. It's encrypted but bears a resemblance to the rebel codes. On decryption, a hushed voice emerged. To all free souls, rendezvous at Alpha Point. Evade the behemoth's gaze. Arlen's face lit up with recognition. It's them. Alpha Point is a pre-designated secret meeting spot. He rapidly fed the new coordinates into the navigation system. As they neared the location, the silhouette of a makeshift space station emerged from the nebula's haze. It was a patchwork of various ships bolted together to form a sanctuary in the void. Small fighters zipped around it, while larger vessels docked, delivering supplies and personnel. They've built a haven in the heart of danger, Lithia whispered, admiration evident in her voice. As their ship approached, a transmission hailed them. Identify yourselves, a stern voice demanded. We come on behalf of Prince Arlen. He's on board our ship. Rice replied, glancing towards the prince. There was a momentary pause before the voice returned, softer now. Welcome home, your highness. The stealth ship slowly docked amidst cheers and salutes. This rebel base, pulsating with life and hope, was a testament to resilience. It was a reminder that even in the darkest recesses of space, unity could forge light. Arlen stepped out first, welcomed by familiar faces and tight embraces. The others followed, each step reinforcing the importance of their journey. They had found the rebels, and in doing so, strengthened the beacon of resistance against the looming Drac menace. Reunion at the Rebel Base The stealth ship's engines hummed down to a whisper as it nestled on the landing pad. The vast doors of the Rebel Stronghold spaceport slid open, revealing the fervent activity beyond. Prince Arlon emerged first, his eyes taking in the organized bedlam before him. Stacks of cargo, ships in repair, and refugees dotted the landscape. The spaceport echoed with the hum of machinery, bartering voices, and the buzz of diverse languages. In the midst of the bustling crowd, a familiar face caught Arlon's attention. Prince Davin! He exclaimed, a warmth evident in his voice. The younger prince turned, a broad smile spreading across his face. Arlon, 
He rushed forward, wrapping his elder brother in a tight embrace. For a brief moment amidst the chaos, the two shared a silent reunion, their bond palpable. When they pulled apart, Davin looked deeply into Arlen's eyes. I had started to fear the worst, he whispered, relief evident in his voice. Arlen gave a weary but resolute smile. It was close. Very close. The weight of their experiences rested between them, and Davin motioned to a nearby seating area. As they settled, Arlen listened intently to Davin's tales of the growing Drac menace and the swell of refugees. The stories were haunting, tales of lost worlds and desperate escapes. When Davin's narrative came to a pause, Arlen took a deep breath, ready to recount his own harrowing tale aboard the Drac behemoth. As he narrated the grim cells and the despair they felt, Davin's face turned increasingly somber. But there was a glimmer of hope, Arlen continued. Draven, he was a guard on the Drac behemoth. He paused, letting the weight of the revelation settle. But he wasn't like the others. He showed us compassion, opened our cell doors, and led us through the maze of the ship's corridors. Without him, we would never have reached our ship. Davin's eyes widened with every revelation. Draven? A Drac guard? How? Arlon's gaze turned distant, weighed down by recollections. I've come to suspect that the Drac employ some form of control, perhaps through devices or drugs, forcing the races they capture to obey their every command. He began, his voice laden with anger and disgust. But in Draven's case, there was something different. A resistance, an ability to fight whatever hold they had over him. Davin leaned forward, listening intently. He was able to break their control? A hint of admiration crept into Arlen's voice. Yes, he defied them. As we raced towards the hangar with alarms echoing and the ship on high alert, Draven was there, leading our escape, defying the very force that sought to control him. Arlen's face darkened. As we reached the stealth ship, he was right behind us, but just as we were about to take off, he was shot while making a run for the ship's ramp. There was no time. We had to leave. Arlon's voice cracked, a hint of guilt lacing his words. We had to escape. Davin placed a hand on his brother's shoulder, attempting to offer solace. He knew the risks. He chose to help, to defy the Drac. His sacrifice won't be forgotten. The princes sat in a shared silence, lost in their thoughts amidst the cacophony of the spaceport, their bond strengthened by the weight of their shared burdens. As the weight of their reunion's emotion settled, Prince Arlen rose with renewed determination. We cannot delay any further, he said, looking deep into Davin's eyes. The revelations from my journey and the presence of our newfound allies demand swift action. I'll call a council meeting. Davin nodded, understanding the urgency, and together they walked towards the heart of the rebel base. Sending a coded signal to the main hall, Arlon summoned the key leaders and representatives, their response was immediate, and soon the hall began filling with voices of both concern and hope. A glimpse into the Federation. The Rebel Base's main hall, a chamber constructed from salvaged ship hulls and illuminated by soft bioluminescent lights, was abuzz with anticipation. Leaders from various factions and representatives of many displaced species gathered, murmuring amongst themselves. At the heart of this assembly stood a large circular table, the round table of the rebel council. Prince Arlon stood at the head of the table, his regal bearing evident even in these dire circumstances. Beside him, Lyra and Rice exchanged brief glances, stealing themselves for the presentation ahead. My fellow leaders, Arlon began, his voice resonating through the hall. I understand we've all had our own struggles, our own tales of perseverance against the Drac. Today I bring you new allies, a new hope. He motioned to Lyra and Rice, who stepped forward. The emblem on their uniforms, a stylized galaxy with a burning star at its center, was unfamiliar to most in the room. I present to you Commanders Lyra and Rice of the Federation, Arlen declared, his tone imbued with respect. Lyra stepped forward, her posture resolute but her gaze containing a hint of uncertainty. The Federation, which I represent alongside Rice, is a vast coalition of systems and races from a distant corner of the galaxy, she began. While we have known peace and cooperation among our planets, we've recently detected unsettling movements from the Drac near our territories. We suspect that their tyrannical expansion will soon reach our realms. 
She continued, her tone earnest. Our original mission was to gather intelligence on the Drac, to understand their tactics, their strengths. But after our capture and subsequent escape alongside Prince Arlon, our mission has evolved. We've come to realize the gravity of the situation. The Drac's ambitions know no bounds. Rice, echoing Lyra's sentiments, added, Knowing what might be on the horizon for our Federation, we believe that an alliance between us would be invaluable. Together we can share technologies, intelligence, and strengths. If the Drax oppression has shown us anything, it's that unity is our most potent weapon against them. Lyra nodded in agreement. While our main objective was reconnaissance, finding Prince Arlon and understanding the true extent of the Drac menace has shifted our priorities. We now seek alliances, unity. Together we can stand strong and prevent the tragedies that have befallen your worlds from reaching ours. Arlon, sensing the weight of the moment, stepped in. I have fought alongside them. I've seen their valor, their honor. While skepticism is warranted, we cannot let distrust hinder potential alliances. We need every advantage against the Drac. The murmurs grew in volume as factions discussed among themselves. The decision would not be simple, but the proposition held a glimmer of hope, a possibility of turning the tides against the seemingly invincible Drac forces. The assembly would continue into the night, weighing the pros and cons of an alliance with the Federation. Yet amidst the debate and discussions, one thing was clear. The Drac had united galaxies in their oppression, and it was that unity that might eventually lead to their downfall. Deliberation and decision. The air inside the main hall grew heavy as the last of Lyra's words echoed away. A low murmur of discussion spread out amongst the members of the Rebel Council. The vast chamber, with its bioluminescent lights casting a dim glow, seemed to shrink under the weight of the decisions that now had to be made. Commander Alicia, a towering figure with a cybernetic arm and a fierce reputation in battle, was the first to break the silence. The Federation lies across the expanse of the galaxy. What guarantee do we have that they will aid us in our time of need, or that they will even arrive in time? Her eyes darted skeptically between Lyra and Rice. Next, Lord Braxis, a humanoid with translucent skin revealing a network of glowing veins, chimed in. The Drax might is unparalleled. We have seen them decimate worlds and reduce civilizations to ashes. Even with the support of this... Federation, how can we hope to stand against such a force? Whispers of agreement rippled through the gathering, and doubt crept into many faces. Yorl, a representative of a nomadic species known for their wisdom, pondered aloud. How do we even know we can trust them? The Drac are masters of deception. For all we know, these two might be their spies. The tension was palpable. However, amidst this swell of skepticism, Arlon stood up. His posture was regal, and his gaze was unwavering as he scanned the room. Commanders, lords, and representatives. He began, the conviction in his voice commanding attention. I too share your concerns. I've witnessed firsthand the devastation the Drac can bring. And yes, the Federation's distance is vast, and our knowledge of them limited. But remember our dire situation. We are dwindling in numbers, losing ground with every passing day. He paused, allowing the weight of his words to sink in, then continued. Lyra and Rice, while strangers to us not long ago, risked everything for my escape, for our escape. Draven, my brother-in-arms forced to do their bidding under their manipulation, broke free from their control to aid our escape. It's evident that not all hope is lost. Arlon stepped closer to the center of the council table, his voice gaining momentum. What I see before me is not just a proposed alliance, but a chance. A chance to share knowledge, technology, and unite against a common foe. The enemy of our enemy is our ally, and if the Drac fear the Federation enough to imprison their agents, then perhaps, just perhaps, this alliance could be the key to turning the tide. A heavy silence followed, eyes shifted, pondering the Prince's words. Whispers filled the room as council members deliberated. Finally, Elder Morin, the eldest member of the council and revered for his experience, rose. We have all heard Prince Arlon. The stakes are high and the risks evident. But as the ancient proverb goes, in unity there is strength. Let us put faith in this alliance. A murmur of agreement spread, and one by one, council members signified their approval. With a sense of hope rekindled, a unanimous decision was reached. Very well. Moran decreed. 
We shall grant Lyra and Rice permission to establish contact with their Federation. Let's send forth a message of collaboration and resistance. Lyra and Rice exchanged a relieved glance, recognizing the gravity of the moment. After consulting with the council members to ensure all vital information about the DRAC was included, Lyra headed to the stealth ship. Using its advanced communication system, she encrypted a message specifically for Ambassador Solane and the Federation. She personally recorded a segment, detailing their experiences and findings. Alongside her recording, a heartfelt message from the Rebel Council was added, underscoring the importance of the Alliance and the dire situation they faced. Once the compilation was complete, she dispatched the communication into the vastness of space, its contents carrying the hopes of an entire resistance. A beacon from afar, a shimmering expanse of stars stretched endlessly across the night canvas of the Federation's central hub. Among its glittering structures, the Federation headquarters stood majestically, a symbol of unity among diverse systems. Inside one of the upper chambers, Ambassador Solane, a figure of authority and responsibility, lay deep in slumber. A life dedicated to diplomacy and strategy had granted him little rest, especially in these testing times. But tonight was different. Tonight, an unexpected beacon cut through the serenity of the early hours. An urgent transmission alarm, a sound Solane had come to dread, pierced the silence. The room's ambient lighting slowly brightened, rousing the ambassador from his sleep. Bleary-eyed, he reached for the communication panel embedded in his bedside table. The encrypted code identified the message's origin, the stealth ship. Selene's heart rate quickened. Lyra and Rice. Memories of their last conversation before the daring mission into Drac territory flooded back. With a deep breath, he activated the message. Lyra's face, weary but determined, appeared on the screen. She narrated their journey. The capture, the unexpected alliance with Prince Arlon, their escape from the Drac behemoth, and the hope found amongst the rebels. Her words were punctuated by supplementary data, charts, and strategic points of interest, as well as a deeply personal plea for support from the rebel leaders. Ambassador Solane sat upright, every fiber of his being focused on the transmission. The weight of the information, the urgency in Lyra's voice, the potential this alliance held, it was a lot to process, but time was a luxury they didn't have. Pressing a button on his wrist communicator, Solon's voice, firm with purpose, resonated through the corridors of the headquarters. Assemble the War Council immediate session, priority one. Within moments, a flurry of activity erupted. Federation officials, military strategists, and representatives from various systems gathered in the Grand War Chamber, a vast amphitheater with a massive holographic display at its center. As the members took their seats, Salon replayed Lyra's message for all to witness. The room was filled with a collective tension, the implications of the information presented not lost on any of the attendees. We have a potential ally, Solane began once the transmission ended. A resistance fighting against the DRAC just as we are. The question we face now is how to best support and integrate their efforts with ours. Debate ensued a cacophony of ideas, strategies, and concerns filling the room. Some spoke of sending reinforcements immediately, while others worried about potential DRAC interception. Still, others pondered on how to share and adapt technology, ensuring a cohesive front against the shared enemy. Hours passed, and as the first light of dawn broke across the horizon, the Council reached a consensus. They would establish a covert line of communication with the rebels, sharing intelligence and resources, all while preparing a joint task force. Ambassador Solane, with the weight of the galaxy on his shoulders, nodded in agreement. This unexpected twist of fate had offered them a glimmer of hope, a chance to turn the tide against the Drac. It was an opportunity they would not waste. The Ambassador's Proposition The vast War Council chamber was awash in low-lit, luminous colors from the central holographic display, echoing with the remembered voice of Lyra as her message replayed for those gathered. The gravity of her recounting, the capture, the incarceration within the cold heart of the Drac behemoth, the unexpected camaraderie with Prince Arlon and the dramatic escape, were still very fresh in their minds, stirring emotions and instilling a profound sense of urgency. Ambassador Solane stood with a poised presence amidst the ring of seasoned military strategists, 
diplomats, and system representatives. His face bore the lines of many sleepless nights, eyes alight with both determination and a glint of hope. We stand, he began, his voice carrying a weight that drew the immediate attention of every individual present. At a pivotal juncture, we faced the Drac in a major confrontation, and although we emerged with significant insights, we must acknowledge that more battles lie ahead. A brief pause allowed his words to sink in. Yet the universe is revealing allies in unexpected corners. We have already seen the Helian Collective extend their hand, committing two of their mightiest battle cruisers to our cause. And now, Solane continued, eyes sweeping the room, ensuring every member grasped the importance of his next words. The rebels under Prince Arlon's leadership present us an opportunity. They offer a front against the Drac we hadn't anticipated. By joining forces with them, we can potentially spread the Drac thin, attacking from angles they won't expect. This alliance is more than just an embodiment of hope. It's a strategic advantage we must seize. The resonating chamber amplified every whisper, every exchanged word. Admiral Laris, a man known for his stringent strategic viewpoint, voiced a question that represented the foremost concern of many. These three cruisers you propose we dispatch, Ambassador. Can they truly traverse such a massive distance so quickly without falling prey to the Drac? Solane met Laris's gaze directly. Admiral, these aren't mere vessels. They've been enhanced with our most cutting-edge propulsion technologies. The crews have undergone rigorous training sessions. Our top engineers and astrophysicists have run every conceivable scenario. A journey of six days is ambitious but achievable. Commander Teresa, with her keen intellect and relentless pursuit for detail, intervened. While time is of essence, trust is paramount. A rushed venture could jeopardize not only our fleet but our potential allies. Solane nodded, appreciating the sentiment. Indeed, Commander, our approach must be twofold. Speed, yes, but also a clear demonstration of our commitment and trustworthiness. Drawing in a steady breath, he continued, To symbolize our earnest intent, these cruisers will be laden with more than just hopes and wishes. They will carry tangible offerings, necessities such as food, medical supplies, and tools. But beyond that, he paused, searching the eyes of those present, ensuring he had their undivided attention. We will equip them with 15 of our most advanced space fighters. This declaration sent a ripple of surprise through the chamber. Such an offering was enormous, a testament to the Federation's recognition of the gravity of the situation and their commitment to the Alliance. Counselor Gian, a revered diplomat from the Andaran system, spoke up. This isn't a mere gesture, Ambassador. It's a significant pledge. With our technological prowess combined with the Rebels' unyielding spirit, this will build trust and offer them more protection from the Drac. The following minutes, which stretched into hours, were marked by fervent discussions and passionate arguments. Every angle was considered, every possibility dissected. The enormity of the decision weighed heavily on all. Yet by the time the first rays of the dawn sun pierced the horizon, illuminating the chamber with a golden hue, there was unity in decision. The Federation would extend its hand, bridging the space between them and their newfound allies. The hope for a unified front against the Drac was stronger than ever. Tactical Outreach The glow from the Grand War Chamber's massive holographic display cast a soft hue over the faces of the attendees, accentuating their rapt attention. Depicted was a detailed map of the galaxy, marked with potential rendezvous points. Given the ever-present threat of the Drac, Selene began, pointing to a shaded region on the hologram. Our chosen rendezvous must be strategic, away from their known regions. His finger hovered over a point nestled between neutral star systems. This space void, I propose, is the place where our two forces can join, untouched by the prying eyes of our enemy. Murmurs of agreement echoed throughout the chamber. The distance and discretion of the location provided a palpable comfort to the officials present. With Rice's combat experience against the Drac... Soline continued, referencing the transmission they had all witnessed. He will be vital in training the rebels on how to handle our new fighters. With his help, this alliance doesn't just have the numbers, but also the tactical prowess. One council member, a strategist named Ilara, piped up. Our new fighters, combined with Rice's knowledge, make a formidable force. We must ensure seamless integration of our forces and theirs. Soline nodded. Indeed. Furthermore, two of our cruisers will remain with the Rebels. Their continued presence will serve dual purposes, 
provide logistical support and stand as a symbol of our burgeoning alliance. And the third? Another council member inquired. Our third cruiser will be instrumental in strengthening our diplomatic ties, Selene responded. After delivering essential supplies, it will return with rebel representatives and Lyra to Federation space, a symbolic and strategic move to cement our newfound alliance. The discussion evolved into a strategic brainstorm. Delegates shared insights, drew up potential pitfalls, and evaluated contingencies. The weight of the decision and its monumental importance to the future of the Federation was felt by everyone. General Torren, one of the most seasoned members of the Council, finally rose from his seat. His experiences spanned numerous intergalactic skirmishes and diplomatic negotiations. Ambassador Selene, he intoned with gravitas. This proposal reflects our commitment to this newfound alliance and our collective determination against the DRAC. It's a testament to our adaptability and hope. Applause spread across the chamber, signifying the overwhelming agreement among the members. As the clapping subsided, Solane gestured towards the communication console, hinting at the next steps. We will relay our proposal to the rebels soon. Until then, let's prepare and hope for a future where our combined forces rewrite the fate of the galaxy. Transmission of Hope In the center of the Grand War Chamber, under the grandeur of its vast dome, a sleek communication console rested. This piece of Federation technology held within its circuits the capability to transmit data across unfathomable distances, breaching the vast void of space to connect distant worlds. Ambassador Selene, accompanied by a handful of key council members, stood around the console. The importance of their next step was not lost on anyone present. Every word, every gesture that would be transmitted would potentially redefine the trajectory of their ongoing conflict with the DRAC. General Torin, leaning against the console's side, looked intently at Selene. We need to be clear, Ambassador. They should know our intentions and plans in detail, but we should also convey our sincere hope for a prosperous future. Selene nodded. Precision and authenticity are crucial. Lyra's report already hints at the trust and camaraderie they've established with the rebels. This transmission will only fortify it. Ilara, one of the Federation's most brilliant linguists and diplomats, had already begun to draft the message on a data pad. We'll start by acknowledging their resilience and the immense potential our alliance holds. Then we can move on to the specifics of our plan. They gathered around Alara's data pad, refining and perfecting the message. Every detail, from the rendezvous point to the cargo and armament on the cruisers, was meticulously explained. The gesture of leaving two of the cruisers as a symbol of alliance, the training Rice would offer, and the eventual return of the third cruiser with Lyra and rebel delegates were all clearly laid out. Solane added, End the message with a note about our shared dream, a universe free from drac oppression, where all species, whether from the Federation or otherwise, can coexist harmoniously. After what felt like hours, Alara finished the draft and read it aloud for final approval. It was concise yet comprehensive, strategic yet heartfelt. The council members present nodded in agreement. With a final look shared between them, Alara transferred the message to the communication console. Selene, with a deep breath, initiated the transmission sequence. A soft hum emanated as the console began its work, encoding the data, amplifying the signal, and shooting it across space towards its intended recipients. In that instant, as the transmission commenced, the War Chamber's expansive ceiling became transparent, revealing the vastness of the cosmos outside. The stars shone brightly, a testament to the multitude of civilizations and worlds out there. Their message, a beacon of hope, traveled at incredible speeds, cutting through that inky darkness, intent on reaching Lyra and the rebels. The council members watched in silent reverence, this wasn't just a transmission of plans, it was a symbol of their resolve, their intent to stand shoulder to shoulder with others in the fight against tyranny. Once the transmission was confirmed sent, General Torin whispered almost to himself, Let's hope this becomes the turning point we've all been waiting for. Solane, looking up at the galaxy stretched above, responded, It's more than hope, General. It's our unwavering belief in a brighter future. They all knew that the coming days would test their conviction, strategy, and unity, but they were ready, ready to shift the balance in the galaxy's power dynamic. State of the Federation. 
The echo of the transmitted message to Lyra and the rebels was still fresh in the chamber's atmosphere when the Council transitioned their discussion, turning their focus back to the immediate state of the Federation. The room, lit by the spectral glow of holographic displays and tactical diagrams, was a hive of activity and strategic discourse. Counselor Ivana took a step forward, her presence commanding attention. Before we become embroiled in the intricacies of external alliances, we must first ascertain our internal situations. Admiral Virek, with scars and medals from countless campaigns, provided the room with an update. Our Eighth Fleet, under the leadership of General Zorvan, stationed at Orinthia, has faced significant losses. We lost six ships, and many others have suffered extensive damage during the battle. However, he paused, nodding appreciatively towards Orinthia's representatives. Due to Orinthian aid, repairs are progressing efficiently. We project that the fleet will regain full operating readiness within the next three to five days. A measured relief spread across the room, yet the shadow of the lost ships lingered palpably. With a brief look at her notes, General Cressa relayed, Regarding our allies, the Helian Collective's two battlecruisers are expected in four days. Their arrival will undeniably enhance our tactical capabilities. Moving the discourse forward, Ambassador Selene intoned, Regarding the DRAC, the one ship that escaped our grasp has now joined its comrades deep in DRAC territory. It's a temporary respite, but we need to understand their intent. The display showcased the DRAC ship's trajectories, a stark visual reminder of the ever-present threat. Director Lorne, head of Federation Intelligence, picked up on Salon's concern. We believe they're consolidating forces, either for reinforcements or to strike elsewhere. We need to get ahead of them. Admiral Virek expressed his frustration. Historically, our intelligence on the DRAC has lagged. We must be proactive, not merely reactive. Lorne nodded, conceding. That's a well-founded observation. We are looking at integrating more stealth reconnaissance ships. Additionally, he added, with a hint of anticipation in his voice, we've managed to secure several DRAC drones. Our team is currently exploring ways to reprogram and utilize them against their creators. The room reverberated with murmurs. Turning the DRAC's assets against them could be a game-changer. With Zorvan at Orinthia, Captain Yelena, the Federation's deputy strategist, filled the room in on the broader strategy. We're reinforcing key junctions and preparing potential ambush sites. But as Director Lorne indicated, a strategic advantage requires better intelligence. Counselor Ivana shifted the topic of conversation, signaling the discussion of the DRAC drone graviton sensor. Dr. Keslin, enlighten us on the advancements. Dr. Keslin, at the forefront of anti-DRAC technology, began, We've incorporated the graviton sensor in 20 of our ships. The results are encouraging. We've neutralized 52 DRAC drones. The implications of that number stilled the room. Selene's voice, somber yet assertive, punctuated the quiet. That number showcases the scale of DRAC infiltration. Our priority must be to equip more ships with this sensor, ensuring we cripple their reconnaissance. Dr. Keslin nodded. Efficiency improvements are underway. The deployment process will speed up. Closing the session, Counselor Ivana voiced the sentiments shared by all. Our adversaries may be formidable, but we possess resilience and innovation. Let's use every asset at our disposal. Resolute in their shared commitment, the Federation stood prepared for the challenges ahead, the situation and the losses. The DRAC regroup. The imposing silhouette of Carvon's behemoth vessel cast a looming shadow as it approached the rendezvous point, flanked by the four DRAC behemoths. Their sleek, dark structures pulsed with malevolent energy, an ominous display of might in the vast expanse of space. The Drac, an impressive sight with their reptilian features, their skin adorned with elaborate patterns signifying rank and legacy, awaited Carvin's arrival with a mix of anticipation and apprehension. Drac communication, often minimalistic and utilitarian, had informed them of the skirmish at Orinthia. They knew a setback had occurred, but the details were scarce. As Carvon's ship docked, the massive bay doors of the leading behemoth opened, allowing him entry. He strode in, his demeanor proud but bearing subtle hints of frustration. In the dimly lit chamber, filled with ambient pulsating noises of the DRAC machinery, Carvon met with the Council of Commanders. Each was a veteran of countless conquests, their prowess evident in the scars and ornaments that adorned their armors.
Report, intoned Dralgon, the eldest of the commanders, his voice a deep rumble that resonated throughout the chamber. Carvin exhaled, recalling the battle's turbulent memories. Orinthia was supposed to be a minor conquest, a mere footnote in our grand campaign, he began. We had the advantage, the surprise. Our initial assaults were devastating to their defenses. Dralgon nodded, urging him to continue. But then... Carvin hesitated, his eyes betraying a rare moment of doubt. We encountered a tactician unlike any we have faced before, General Zorvan of the Federation's Eighth Fleet. A murmur went through the assembled commanders. They had heard of Zorvan, but only as distant whispers from conquered territories. Zorvan did the unpredictable. He adapted to our maneuvers, anticipated our strategies, Carvin elaborated, and the EMP bombs they deployed. They rendered a significant portion of our arsenal ineffective. Their destructive capabilities were beyond anything we've encountered. Skeltris, a commander known for her ruthless aggression, hissed, So we were outplayed? Carvon met her gaze, his voice firm. Not outplayed. Outmaneuvered, perhaps. But this is an aberration in our otherwise illustrious campaign. It is the first time we've faced such resistance. Such, a uh, cunning. Skeltris retorted, It is a sign that our tactics must evolve. Our dominance has been unchallenged for eons. Perhaps we've become complacent. Carvon, while wounded by the event, refused to let the setback dominate him. Indeed, and that is precisely why I've convened this gathering. We must adjust our approach, prepare for such eventualities. The Federation, it appears, is not the feeble adversary we perceive them to be. Another commander, Grevlock, inquired. What do you propose? Carvon, after a moment of contemplation, replied. Detailed analysis of the battle, scrutinizing Zorvan's strategies, understanding the mechanics of these EMP bombs. We must learn from this encounter, adapt, and ultimately overcome. Dralgon, his voice heavy with the wisdom of centuries, concluded the assembly. This battle was not just a physical skirmish. It was a clash of intellects. We will adjust, evolve. We must not underestimate our adversaries again. The galaxy is vast, and while we have reigned supreme, new challenges will always emerge. Let Orinthia be a lesson. As the commanders dispersed, Carvon remained, lost in his thoughts. The weight of the battle was still fresh, but the Drac's indomitable spirit surged within him. They would learn, adapt, and the next encounter would tell a different tale. Anxious Deliberations the Grand War Room of the Federation had witnessed countless debates and strategic sessions, but the atmosphere today was palpably different. The sweeping conference table was surrounded by a varied group of council members, all with eyes locked onto the central holographic projector. The weight of anticipation was almost tangible, and the only sound to pierce the silence was the soft hum of machinery and the sporadic shifting of those in attendance. At the head of the table sat Ambassador Solane, his demeanor betraying the weight of his thoughts. The lines etched into his face seemed deeper today, and his hands, usually so steady, betrayed a slight tremor. Awaiting the Rebel Alliance's response to their proposed alliance was a nerve-wracking endeavor. The potential consequences of a refusal from the Rebels weighed heavily on him and every member present. As the silence deepened, a soft chime echoed throughout the room. The Council's attention immediately shifted to Solane's wrist comm device, its display emanating a soft blue light. Tapping the device, the room was filled with the clear, crisp voice of Captain Jorvis. Ambassador Solane and esteemed Council members, the recording began, I report to you from the Helian shipyards, a marvel of engineering and cooperation. There was an unmistakable shift in the room's atmosphere. Every ear strained, every eye focused intently on the hologram as Captain Jorvis's words continued. This was the man in charge of what could be the game-changing upgrade of the Federation's battle cruisers. The Helian technology surpasses all our expectations. Jorvis's voice conveyed a mix of reverence and awe. In just seven days, we have witnessed advancements that challenge our very understanding of science and engineering. The progress on the phaser upgrades is staggering, nearing completion. Preliminary tests on the integrated shield emitters display a resilience never before seen in Federation technology. The hologram shifted, showing glimpses of Helian scientists collaborating seamlessly with Federation engineers. Their commitment to our cause is beyond commendable. Our teams are learning, adapting, and more importantly, evolving. 
They're not just training us on the technology. They're teaching us to rethink our very approach to battle. The room was electric, each word from the captain painting a vivid picture of hope and advancement. Jorvis continued, Given the pace and dedication of the Helians, there is a strong likelihood that we may complete the upgrades ahead of the initially estimated 30 days. But we still have a long road ahead. Our commitment remains unwavering. And with the Helians by our side, I have no doubt we will achieve our goals. The recording concluded, leaving the Council in a contemplative silence. Their understanding of the mission's significance had been profound, but hearing Jorvis's update, seeing the tangible progress, gave them a concrete sense of hope. Ambassador Selene broke the silence, his voice steady yet charged with emotion. The union with the Helians isn't just a tactical advantage. This collaboration symbolizes hope, unity, and the power of combined strengths. It's a beacon for the Federation and all its allies. His gaze swept the room, meeting the eyes of each council member. With these advancements and our combined resolve, the Drac won't know what hit them. The nods and murmurs of agreement echoed the shared sentiment of a Federation on the cusp of a renaissance, driven by innovation and a shared cause. Helian Technological Mastery Deep within the heart of the Helian shipyard, a majestic symphony of collaboration was unfolding. It was a dance between the old and the new, the known and the unknown. The Federation crew, with their deep-set methodologies and practices, found themselves in an environment that often felt surreal, a tribute to Helian innovation. Captain Jorvis, a man whose life was defined by the cold steel of Federation ships and the humming of their engines, felt like a child taking his first steps into the universe. Everywhere he turned, there was a marvel waiting to be discovered. One such moment occurred as he stood by a Federation cruiser's phaser array. He had seen it being fired countless times, had understood its limitations and capabilities. But as Dr. Thelian approached, a series of holograms dancing around his fingertips, Jorvis's understanding was about to be radically altered. You see, Captain, Dr. Thelian began, his voice a soothing blend of authority and warmth. Your phaser technology is, in essence, a focused beam of particles. It's powerful, yes, but it's predictable. The Drac have studied its patterns. They know how to counter it. Jorvis nodded, taking in the words. And the Helian approach? Dr. Thelian smiled, his eyes gleaming with a mix of mischief and pride. He gestured towards the holograms, which displayed a swirling mass of energy, unlike anything Jorvis had ever seen. We don't focus on just one form of energy. We weave them. This is a blend of particle beams, plasma emissions, and harmonic resonances. When combined, they form a tapestry of destructive power that is almost impossible to predict and counter. Jorvis's eyes widened. The concept was simple, but its execution was pure genius. This was not just an upgrade, it was a revolution. As days turned into nights and back to days, the Federation crew and Helian scientists toiled together. There were challenges, of course. Helian technology, though advanced, was not just a plug-and-play solution for Federation ships. It required adaptation, an understanding of the core principles that guided both civilizations. One evening, as Jorvis and Dr. Thelian stood overlooking the vastness of the shipyard, bathed in the soft glow of a thousand ships and tools, they shared a quiet moment. We are not just integrating technology, Dr. Thelian. Jorvis began, his voice soft, reflective. We are integrating philosophies, dreams, and aspirations. We are forging a bond that transcends metal and circuits. Dr. Thelian nodded. That, Captain, is the essence of true collaboration. You bring to the table your experiences, your struggles, your victories. We bring ours. And together, we create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. As they stood side by side, two leaders from different corners of the universe, there was a palpable sense of camaraderie. Their teams, once strangers divided by a vast technological gulf, now laughed, shared, and learned together. The shipyard was not just a place of upgrades, it was a crucible where a new alliance was forged. An alliance that promised not only advanced weaponry and enhanced shields, but a future where the Federation and Helians stood shoulder to shoulder against the terrors of the universe. The Rebel Council's Judgment. The bustling sanctuary nestled within the Viserian Nebula, a makeshift space station forged from a myriad of ships, stood testament to the Rebels' indomitable spirit. Among the vessels docked there was Lyra's stealth ship, 
emblematic of their audacious escape from Drac captivity. Lyra, with the urgency of the Federation's transmission weighing on her, located Prince Arlen amidst an intensive strategic session with the rebel leaders. Interrupting, she said, Your Highness, a crucial transmission from the Federation. Silence descended upon the room. Prince Arlen accessed the message, letting the holographic playback fill the room with Ambassador Solane's voice detailing the offer of alliance, resources, and the advanced fighters. The atmosphere was palpable. As the message concluded, the council members exchanged glances, hope, speculation, and strategy reflecting in their eyes. This isn't just about matching the drac and firepower, voiced Lithia. It's the unity, the synchrony of two formidable forces striking as one. Prince Davin, Arlen's fiery younger brother with an almost contagious fervor, said, The Federation's commitment is our game changer. With these resources, we not only defend, but also counterattack. Amid the discussions, Rice became acutely aware of a segment of the message directed specifically at him. His Federation insignia subtly gleaming, he absorbed the responsibility the Federation War Council bestowed upon him. It appears I've been entrusted to train your pilots with the upcoming fleet, Rice remarked, a hint of pride and determination evident in his tone. I'm ready and honored. Prince Arlen took a moment to absorb the weight of the transmission and the decision that lay before them. He looked around, gauging the room's sentiment. The Federation has made its offer, he began. But our path, as always, will be determined collectively. We shall convene in the main chamber shortly, with the entirety of the Council, and decide our course. The meeting adjourned, leaving a palpable tension in its wake. Prince Arlon took Lyra's arm as they exited. The Federation's outreach could be the beacon we've been searching for, he whispered. But as with all decisions of this magnitude, we must approach with unity and purpose. And thus, it was set that the pivotal moment in the Rebels' history would take place under the watchful gaze of the entire Council, determining not just their immediate path, but the fate of their resistance. A New Dawn Inside the heart of the Viserian Nebula's sanctuary, the decision of the millennia awaited. Assembled around an antiquated round table, symbolizing unity and equality, the Rebel Council members convened. At its head, Prince Arlen stood, an embodiment of the hope and determination his people so fervently clung to. The Federation offers not just weapons and technology, but a renewed spirit, an invigorated sense of purpose, began Prince Arlen, his voice resonant in the chamber. What say you, my Council? Shall we intertwine our fates for the promise of a free galaxy? One by one, each member stood, signifying their vote. The unanimity was striking. Every council member stood in favor of the alliance. The weight of their collective resolve filled the chamber, a tangible force of unity and defiance. The separate struggles and histories of the Federation and the rebels merged, forging an alliance built on shared purpose and mutual respect. Upon the council's dissolution, Prince Arlon promptly set to the next pressing task, preparing the rebels' response to the Federation. Lyra swiftly crafted the message, her fingers flying over the holographic keyboard as Arlon provided his input. We, the united races of the Rebel Council, gladly accept the Federation's gracious offer of alliance. Lyra vocalized as she typed, We will rendezvous at the suggested location in seven days. Let this alliance be the dawn of a new era, a beacon of hope in our fight against the Drac. Rice, overhearing the conversation, interjected with evident enthusiasm. Ambassador Solane's trust in me wasn't misplaced. I look forward to training the rebel pilots, ensuring our combined forces are a force the Drac will dread. A sense of purposeful urgency permeated the rebel base. Preparations began immediately. Prince Arlon, with Rice and Lyra at his side, navigated the docking bays, where the rebel fleet stood as silent testament to numerous battles and scars of war. From the nimble fighters, burn marks etched into their chassis, to the mighty battleships flaunting insignias of myriad worlds, each vessel narrated tales of defiance, bravery, and the indomitable spirit of those who resisted oppression. Prince Arlen, while observing the vast armada, made a pivotal choice. To represent our unity, we'll take five battlecruisers from different alien races for the rendezvous, he decreed, pointing towards ships of diverse designs and origins. These vessels weren't just war machines. They were symbols of the rich tapestry of life and cultures that made up the Rebel Alliance. 
The selected battle cruisers began immediate preparations, their crew making swift work of refueling, restocking, and finalizing battle plans. As the crews bustled with activity, the word spread. They would move out in 48 hours, meeting the Federation at the agreed rendezvous point. As the suns of the nearby systems set, casting a myriad of colors upon the vast expanse of space, the base became a hive of action. The decision of the Council, the ensuing preparations, and the promise of the rendezvous with the Federation filled the atmosphere with hope. The Nebula's sanctuary, which once was a beacon of last resort, now gleamed with the promise of a brighter future. Prince Arlen, standing atop the observation deck, surveyed the frenetic scene below. This alliance is the dawn we've longed for, the first ray of light in our prolonged night. And as ships readied and crews prepped, that dawn seemed ever closer. A horizon filled with promise and the possibility of a galaxy free from the Drax shadows. The Drax Whispers in the heart of Drax's capital city, a dimly lit chamber became the meeting point of shadows and secrets. Zalian, a high-ranking Drax spy, paced impatiently until a hologram flickered to life, revealing a veiled figure known only as the Whisperer. The Rebel Council is mobilizing. The Whisperer hissed. Their hope, fueled by a newfound alliance, threatens our dominion. Zalian's scales shimmered with a mix of anger and surprise. The Federation? He mused aloud. It's a gambit they'll regret. The Whisperer leaned closer, the distortion of the hologram obscuring their features even more. There's more. The Federation plans to send aid and warships to support the Rebels. Zelian's eyes darkened. That mustn't be allowed to happen. He growled. The Rebels on their own were a minor inconvenience. I was almost tempted to let them be for a while. But an alliance with the Federation? That changes everything. We must intervene. Keep me informed. Zellian commanded, his tone dripping with menace. The rebels and their Federation allies will soon learn the price of defiance. As the transmission ended, Zellian gazed out of the chamber's window, staring at the vast expanse of the galaxy. A smirk formed on his lips. The game of galaxies had just become even more intriguing. A glimpse into the abyss. In the heart of the Drac Dominion, away from the prying eyes of lesser beings, stood the command center, a testament to Drax's technological prowess. Massive spires converged into a central chamber, dimly lit, where the gentle hum of advanced machinery provided a backdrop to the decisive whisper of interstellar plots and machinations. Inside this chamber, dominating its vast expanse, was the hollow display. It shimmered and blinked, bringing to life the vastness of the universe with an accuracy no other species could boast of. Star systems, nebulae, trade routes, and fleet movements were all intricately mapped out in spectral luminescence, weaving the story of a cosmos teetering on the edge of a conflict of unseen proportions. Carvon, recently arrived from the skirmishes of Orinthia, still held the residue of battle in his demeanor. His reptilian scales glistened under the ambient lights, and a gaze sharper than the finest blade remained locked on the hollow display. The myriad lights reflected brilliantly off his eyes, which darted from one point to another, assessing, calculating. To any onlooker, with his long snout and the slow, rhythmic flick of his forked tongue, he might seem like an artist appreciating a masterpiece. Yet in truth, he was a strategist, a hunter of sorts, analyzing his prey's movements and vulnerabilities. The universe, he mused, a vast, endless expanse. Yet every inch of it bends, knowingly or not, to the will of the Drac. As his mind danced from star to star, from galaxy to galaxy, a profound sense of entitlement and purpose filled him. This was not mere space. This was the canvas upon which the Drac Dominion painted its tale of conquest. But as with all stories, there were challenges, obstacles that dared to impede the march of fate. And as of late, there were gaps in that luminous tapestry. Carvon's sharp gaze narrowed upon them, sectors of Federation space where the light was duller, the information older. These were the blind spots. His jaw tightened, his earlier sense of dominion replaced by a sliver of concern. How is it possible? He thought. For generations, the Drac had prided themselves on their impeccable information network, built on the silent, relentless work of their drones. These gaps, these blind spots, they weren't just voids. 
They were an affront to the Drac's supremacy. The universe might be vast, but for the Drac to lack information on even its tiniest segment was an anomaly. He stepped closer to the hollow display, reaching out with a gloved hand to touch a particularly large blind spot, the cold luminance responding to his touch. The display zoomed in, detailing the last pieces of information from the sector. But it was dated, over a month old, ancient by Drac standards. Carvon's thoughts raced. The Federation was a formidable adversary, no doubt, but for them to find a way to disrupt Drac's surveillance grid was unexpected. It spoke of an adaptability, a resilience, that he hadn't credited them with. He pulled back, his gaze now sweeping across the entirety of the map. Where else had they been left blind? How much of the Federation's moves were now shrouded in secrecy? It wasn't fear that crept into his thoughts, but rather a sense of exhilaration. This was the thrill of the chase, the sharpening of a blade against an equally unyielding edge. Yet the question lingered, like an itch at the back of his mind. What or who was responsible for these gaps? The Federation's technological prowess, as far as he knew, had its limits. There had to be another piece to this puzzle, another player on the board. His contemplation was interrupted by the soft chime of an incoming message. Pulling his gaze away from the vastness before him, Fleet Commander Carvon prepared to face whatever challenges lay ahead. But one thing was for certain. The game was afoot, and the Drac Dominion, despite these temporary setbacks, would not be deterred. The Silent Observers The ambient hum of the command center's machinery barely registered to Carvon as he focused his attention on the newly retrieved data modules. Each module, an intricate array of spiraled memory chambers, held valuable intelligence from the Drac drones. Carvon admired their construction, the crystalline structures refracting light into delicate spectrums, representing data in its purest form. He placed one of the modules into the central interface. Within moments, vast constellations of data spread out before him, the hollow display flickering with fresh input. Each drone had been meticulously designed, a testament to Drac engineering and their voracious appetite for knowledge. These silent observers floated through space, hidden from the naked eye, recording the machinations of the universe around them. In their subtlety and precision, Carvon saw a reflection of the Drac Dominion itself, silent, watchful, and always one step ahead. But as he parsed through the information, a growing unease settled in the pit of his stomach. There were clear signs of aging intel, movements of ships and fleets that were weeks old, strategic positions that had surely been altered by now. The drones should have relayed newer data. Their continuous flow of information was what kept the Drac Dominion informed and dominant. This wasn't the work of simple machinery malfunction or natural obstacles in space. It was more systemic, more deliberate. Someone or something was hunting their observers. He paused on a particular segment of data that seemed oddly familiar. A certain energy signature, a faint blip on the hollow display, was eerily reminiscent. With a slow realization, the memories flooded back. His own ship, surrounded by a force he hadn't anticipated, the uncanny maneuvers, and that distinct energy reading, Helion. The Helions. Their technology was known to bend and manipulate light in ways the Drac hadn't mastered. It wasn't a stretch to assume they might have a hand in masking or even targeting the drones. He remembered his encounters with them, the weight of their gaze, as they held a resilience he hadn't anticipated. There was a particularly haunting memory of a standoff, both fleets at the precipice of battle. The Helians, while technologically advanced, had been outnumbered, but they had something else, a determination, a spirit that even the vast dominion of the Drac found hard to quell. Pulling himself back to the present, Carvon's thoughts raced. If the Helians had indeed allied with the Federation, their combined strength and technological prowess posed a significant challenge. They could effectively blind the Drac in regions of strategic importance. Carvon's forked tongue flicked out in contemplation. A move had to be made, and soon— while the silent observers had provided them with an edge so far, it was clear they were now in a grander game of cosmic chess. He summoned an aide. Get me the engineering reports on the latest Drac drones and have the intelligence team run an analysis on all Helian encounters. I want to know how they're doing it. The aide nodded, swiftly leaving to execute the orders. Carvon, meanwhile, kept his eyes fixed on the hollow display, 
a strategic predator poised to strike, but with the growing realization that his prey was evolving. Whispers of rebellion. Carvon's thoughts were a deep whirlpool of strategy and counter-strategy as he navigated the maze of information before him. The room's ambient sound was broken when a hurried set of footsteps approached. His train of thought was suddenly interrupted by a subordinate, visibly out of breath, making a sharp salute. Commander Carvan, the underling began, his voice edged with urgency. We've received intelligence from our Whisperer network at the Rebel base. Carvan's reptilian eyes snapped towards the messenger, narrowing intently. Continue. Our Whisperers, embedded within the Rebel ranks, have relayed crucial information. The Rebels, they've allied themselves with the Federation, the underling reported, the weight of the revelation evident in his voice. Producing a data slate, he added, This contains all the detailed reports from our informant. The slate's screen pulsed with the transmitted message from their covert operative. Carvin swiftly skimmed the content, each word solidifying his concern. The message spoke of collaborative military exercises, shared intelligence, and worse yet, discussions of unified operations to target DRAC interests. The Alliance wasn't just a mere pact. It was a strategic coalition forged in the fires of a common adversary. By the void, Carvon muttered, the gravity of the situation dawning upon him. The Drac Dominion, for all its might, had often been able to quell opposition by dividing and conquering. A unified front between the Rebels and the Federation, though, was an unprecedented challenge. He took a moment, letting the information sink in. His mind, trained and honed for moments like this, began processing the implications and crafting a response. This was a pivotal juncture. The Dominion could either let this alliance consolidate and become a tangible threat, or act swiftly, cutting it down while it was still finding its feet. Carvon's decision was clear. Summon the fleet commanders, he ordered, his tone sharp and authoritative. Within minutes, the command center was bustling with activity. High-ranking DRAC officers, their scales shimmering in the room's dim light, gathered around the central hollow display. Carvon took center stage, his presence commanding immediate attention. The rebels have joined forces with the Federation, he began, ensuring every eye was on the data slate's message. Our current intelligence is outdated and our drones have been compromised in key sectors. Murmurs of concern spread among the officers, but Carvon's next statement silenced them. We need fresh intelligence and we need it now, he declared, determination evident in his voice. I want this entire sector flooded with our drones, double, no, triple their usual numbers, and employ the newer models, the ones less susceptible to Helian interference. Nods of agreement echoed around the room, and officers began to relay the commands. Carvon wasn't done, though. Furthermore, dispatch two Drac behemoths to the rebel base. Let them understand the price of allying against the Dominion. An officer hesitated. Sir, the behemoths? Aren't they overkill for a mere rebel base? Carvon's gaze turned icy. Do not underestimate them, especially now that they have Federation backing. They may be rebels, but they are a growing spark, and I intend to snuff it out before it becomes a raging inferno. The command center's air was thick with tension, each officer realizing the gravity of the commander's words. Carvon's adaptability was evident. He wasn't one to be complacent or ignore the shifting sands of the cosmic battlefield. Threats were to be nipped in the bud, alliances shattered, and dominion maintained. As the officers dispersed to execute his directives, Carvon gazed back at the hollow display, the data slate's message still glowing. The universe was vast, filled with whispers and shadows, but the Drac intended to remain its most potent voice. A new front. The swirling galaxy map continued to cast its glow across the command center, revealing points of interest, fleet movements, and the vast expanse of known space. Commander Carvon, with a flick of his clawed hand, expanded a section of Federation territory. A specific cluster caught his attention, a location distant from the hustle and bustle of Central Federation planets and seemingly off the beaten path. He focused on one particular planet, its blue and green surface dotted with vast oceans and sprawling continents. But it wasn't the beauty of this celestial body that intrigued him. Instead, it was the weak defenses the Federation had placed around it, its isolation, and the strategic advantage it provided. Incompetence, sheer incompetence, Carvin mused aloud, 
his voice dripping with contempt. He had expected more from the Federation, especially after their recent alliances. Their oversight shall be our gain. Standing tall, he addressed his command team. Orinthia was a statement of our might, but seizing it now would drain our resources. It's heavily fortified, and Zarvan's presence makes it unpredictable. We need a forward base, and this... He pointed at the planet. This world will be the bedrock of our next offensive. His operations officer, a drac of smaller stature but with an intelligence that made him one of Carvon's most valued assets, looked at the screen, processing the strategy. Sir... The defenses on this planet appear to be minimal. It seems they never anticipated a drac assault from this front. That's the nature of war, Carvon replied, his gaze never leaving the hollow display. One must always anticipate the unexpected. The Federation's complacency will be their downfall. He felt a sense of satisfaction at the thought of outsmarting his adversaries, of striking where they least expected. Deploy the 15 behemoths. Have them establish a forward operating base on that planet. Once secured, it will be our spearhead into the Federation's heart. The room hummed with activity as orders were relayed. The massive drac behemoth vessels, dreadnoughts of the void, prepared for their journey. Their sheer size and firepower were enough to subdue most threats, and against a minimally defended planet, they would be unstoppable. Carvon leaned forward, resting his scaly hands on the control panel. This world is but a stepping stone. Once it's under our control, the core Federation planets will be within our reach. They may have won a few battles, but the war, the war is far from over. As his officers moved with renewed vigor, preparing the fleet for its next assault, Carvon allowed himself a moment of reflection. The universe was a vast chessboard, and he was but one player. Yet every move he made, every strategy he devised, brought the Drac Dominion closer to victory. The Federation, with its alliances and its technology, was formidable, but they had one weakness that Carvon didn't. They were reactive, always responding to threats rather than preempting them. This weakness was something Carvon did not share. Framed against the luminescent hollow display, his silhouette loomed, eyes fixed on the planet that would soon serve as a new Drac stronghold. The glow from this world emphasized the Federation's unpreparedness for the impending conflict on this unexpected front. Carvon's relentless ambition echoed through the vast command center, foreshadowing battles on the horizon, battles that held the power to redefine the very destiny of the universe. Alliance forged in stars. The Federation War Council chambers buzzed with activity the vast expanse echoing with muted conversations from members of the Galactic Federation. Distinctive figures from a multitude of species, ranging from the aquatic aquarids with their shimmering scales to the smooth-skinned Galathians with their pale blue hue, congregated in animated anticipation. A heightened sense of expectancy settled over the assembly as Ambassador Solane approached the central command dais. Tapping a few commands on the console, he projected a message onto the expansive viewscreen. The intricate symbols and characters of the galactic standard language flashed briefly before fading away. But the message was clear. The atmosphere in the chamber shifted perceptibly. The rebels had formally accepted their offer of alliance and the proposed military aid. A harmonious blend of approval and hope resounded in the chamber. Representatives of various races, council members, and war strategists looked on as Selene broke the silence. The rebels have accepted our offer, Selene began, his voice steady and filled with gravitas. We now have an alliance that empowers us to take the fight to the Drac. Eyes from all corners of the room shifted to the expansive windows, where three human battlecruisers hovered, bathed in the ambient glow of distant stars. These formidable vessels, their sleek profiles hinting at a design prioritizing agility and speed, were already primed for departure, laden with medical supplies, military equipment, and the promised 15 fighter craft. The Federation had ensured they were prepped and on standby, even before the affirmative from the rebels, a testament to their strategic foresight and readiness. Taking a moment to acknowledge the weight of the situation, Solane continued, these vessels are more than just carriers of supplies and hope. They represent the Federation's commitment, our unity, and our readiness to confront the Drac head-on. The journey to the rendezvous point with our rebel allies is six days. Every moment counts. Commands were swiftly relayed. Crew members of various species bustled about, ensuring last-minute checks and communication protocols were in place. 
The atmosphere in the chambers was electric, every member feeling a part of this monumental decision. Outside the chamber windows, the scene transformed from serene to dynamic. The cruisers, engines humming with a soft but powerful resonance, signaled their readiness. As Solane gave the final directive, the ship's faster-than-light FTL drives were activated. Space around them warped and stretched, and in a breathtaking dance of light and technology, the cruisers disappeared into the vast unknown, leaving behind a spectacle of twinkling stardust. Turning back to the Council, Selene's demeanor exuded both determination and hope. Our path is set. This alliance is our beacon in these dark times. With unity and resolve, we will bring the fight to the Drac, and together, we'll shape the future of the galaxy. The Strength of Humanity Aboard one of the human battlecruiser, the hum of the FTL drives receded into the background. The expansive command center, with its panoramic views of the swirling blues and violets of subspace, was a buzz with activity. Screens dotted the space, displaying an array of data from ship diagnostics to real-time strategy simulations. Commander Ilara Vance, the cruiser's captain, walked over to a larger hollow display. With a simple gesture, she activated an interactive schematic of the cruiser. The display, with its intricate layers of data, showcased the ship's engineering marvel. Its sleek and compact design was a testament to human ingenuity, prioritizing agility without compromising firepower. As several officers and Federation representatives gathered around, Ilara initiated a simulation. A series of holographic clips began playing, recounting the recent minor war with the Veritans. The displays showed human cruisers gracefully evading heavier Veritan vessels, executing precise maneuvers that seemed impossible for ships of their size. Their lasers, strikingly powerful, danced through space, disabling Veritan shields with ease. The imagery wasn't just for spectacle. It was a strategic overview. Much of what you're seeing, Alara began, pointing towards the displays, is our recent advancements post the Veritan conflict. We've heard rumors that the Helians do something similar with their phasers. It's comforting to know we're on the right track. Our original phaser design gave us a considerable edge during our skirmishes with the Veritans. Their ships simply weren't prepared for our weapons. And with our new adaptations, our phasers are even more powerful. A Galathian officer, his smooth, pale blue skin reflecting under the soft glow of the hollow light, inquired, The data we reviewed on your ships was impressive, but how do they fare against the Drac behemoths? Elara responded with a glint of determination in her eyes. The Drac behemoths are formidable, no doubt. In a one-on-one, -on -one, our cruiser would be at a disadvantage. But our strength lies in strategy, agility, and combined firepower. Activating another simulation, she continued. Our analysis indicates that a collective assault from three of our cruisers, bolstered by a complement of 45 fighters, could, in theory, neutralize a Drac behemoth. A hushed murmur swept across the room. Whispers of admiration mixed with strategic contemplation. An Aquarid representative, her voice echoing with a melodic lilt, asked, Your commanders have always shown exemplary leadership. How are they preparing for this mission? Commander Vance nodded, understanding the gravity of the query. Each of our vessels harbors Federation personnel. We understand the importance of a unified approach, but when it comes to executing strategies, our human commanders take the lead. We've been in the thick of it faced losses, and have learned from our past confrontations. Our experience against the Veritans, coupled with our adaptability, gives us an edge. Siler, a Galathian delegate, gracefully extended one of his slender hands. Beyond the imminent combative engagements, our mission has a diplomatic pulse. The heart of this alliance is not just in the might of our combined fleets, but in the threads of trust we weave together. Once we rendezvous with the rebels, Representatives like us will step forward. Our role is to bridge any cultural or strategic divides and ensure a cohesive alignment of our forces and our ideals. The success of this alliance hinges not just on battles won in space, but on the understanding we foster between the rebels and the Federation. Vance acknowledged with a nod. A united front in war and diplomacy. That's what will give us the advantage against the Drac. The discussion transitioned to a detailed strategy session, drawing upon the strengths of the Federation's diverse members and the unique capabilities of the human vessels.
As the ship continued its journey through the ethereal realm of FTL, the team aboard was united in purpose, hope, and resolve. They were not just an alliance, they were a beacon of strength in the vast expanse of space. The Rebels Advance The Rebel base, bathed in the ethereal glow of its power cores, was a symphony of organized chaos. Starfighters whizzed about, docking stations clamped onto vessels for refueling, and technicians scrambled with last-minute checks. But amidst this hive of activity, a group stood apart, under the looming shadow of one of the five massive rebel battle cruisers. Prince Arlon, a figure of authority with a demeanor that radiated strength, held a strategy slate, discussing the last-minute details with Lyra and Rice. Lyra's focus remained sharp, the weight of the upcoming rendezvous pressing heavily on her shoulders. Rice, though equally determined, allowed himself a smirk, trying to ease the tension. We've been waiting for this moment, haven't we? Rice quipped, eyes dancing with mischief. Lyra shot him a look, half amused, half exasperated. We have. Prince Arlon acknowledged with a nod. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. The Federation's alliance, especially the addition of their human fleet, is just the advantage we need. But we have a long journey ahead. The anticipation amongst the rebel leaders was palpable. Every now and then, council members would approach the trio, confirming coordinates, checking weapon systems, and sharing the morale of their troops. The camaraderie between the rebel leaders, their council, and the troops was evident. They were not just an army. They were a family, bound by a shared purpose and a history of resistance. Amid the preparations, Prince Davin, Arlon's brother, made his way to a secluded alcove of the hangar. With deliberate stealth, he placed a small device onto a console. A faint, almost indiscernible hum emanated from it before it seemingly blended into the machinery. Next, he opened a private communication channel, sending out a short encrypted message. To anyone passing by, his actions might appear as just another pre-flight check, yet the subtlety and secrecy hinted at underlying intentions not readily apparent. The true nature of Davin's act lingered, shrouded in mystery. As Davin returned to join the group, his countenance betrayed nothing of his secretive actions. Arlen, placing a reassuring hand on Davin's shoulder, signaled to the crew that it was time. Let's make history, he declared, the determination in his voice echoing throughout the hangar. The massive engines of the Rebel battlecruiser rumbled to life, its energy cores glowing brighter with each passing second. Crew members hurried on board, and as the boarding ramps retracted, the cruiser's protective shields enveloped it. With a final glance at their home base, Prince Arlen, Lyra, Rice, and Davin settled into their respective positions aboard the cruiser. The navigation console blinked, the FTL drive primed and ready. In a brilliant display of light and energy, the Rebel fleet leapt into FTL. The trails they left behind weren't just of displaced space. They were blazing streaks of hope, resilience, and determination. The universe watched, and the tides of war ebbed, readying for a clash that would decide the fate of galaxies. Drac Ambition Inside the dimly lit, sprawling Drac Command Center, vast holographic displays painted a menacing picture of the vastness of space. The sheer scale of the room was a testament to the Drac's ambition, built to oversee their galactic conquests. Commanders of various ranks moved with purpose, their scales shimmering in the room's ambient glow, each well aware of the tasks that lay ahead. Dominating one of the holographic screens was a formation of 15 behemoths, their massive silhouettes casting a menacing aura even in this virtual representation. These behemoths, the pinnacle of Drac engineering and firepower, were unlike any other vessel in the galaxy. They were monuments of dread, designed to instill fear and maintain control. A platform in the center elevated, revealing Carvon, his large frame radiating authority. His scales, a shade darker than the others and etched with battle scars, hinted at countless battles and strategic triumphs. Around him, the commanders straightened, giving him their undivided attention. Commanders, Carvon's voice echoed through the vast chamber, each syllable dripping with conviction. The time has come for our next move. While we've made significant strides, there's always room for improvement, for adaptation. These fifteen vessels will embark on a crucial mission, one that will further solidify our dominance. He paused, ensuring he had the room's complete attention, then continued. 
Our engineers have been diligently addressing the EMP bombs that have been a persistent nuisance in our recent encounters. We've developed a new program that detects the onset of an EMP detonation. Upon detection, the program immediately and temporarily shuts down the affected section of our ship, reducing the downtime from minutes to mere seconds. Murmurs of approval rumbled through the gathered commanders. This adaptation was a significant stride in negating the debilitating effects of the EMP attacks. I'm sure some of you will get an opportunity to test this out for real in the coming weeks. Carvon wasn't done. Moreover, we've made a comprehensive review of the Federation's latest tactics. New codes of battle have been devised, ensuring that if they attempt to replicate Captain Zorvan's strategies or any such maneuvers, they'll find themselves severely outmatched. A hologram showcased a simulation where Federation ships tried employing previous successful tactics, only to be countered swiftly and effectively by the DRAC vessels. The demonstration was a clear message. Adaptability was the key to their continued dominance. A commander, his scales gleaming gold, stepped forward. Sector Commander Carvon, with these upgrades in our might, the Federation and their new allies won't stand a chance. Carvon nodded, a glint of satisfaction in his eyes. Indeed, but complacency has been the downfall of many great empires. We'll not make that mistake. Always stay a step ahead, anticipate their moves, and counteract before they even realize. Drawing the meeting towards its climax, Carvon's tone turned colder, more calculating. Lastly, an update on the two behemoths en route to the rebel base. The room grew silent, every drac waiting in anticipation. Their directive remains unchanged, total annihilation. I expect no survivors. The rebels, with their audacity to challenge our reign, shall serve as an example of the fate that befalls those who oppose us. A shiver ran through the commanders, not of fear, but of admiration and loyalty towards their leader. They understood the importance of making an example of the rebels, of showcasing the might and ruthlessness of the Drac Empire. As the meeting adjourned, the behemoth fleet started its slow and menacing journey, their trajectory a clear path of conquest and dominance. In the vast reaches of space, the Drac ambition was once again on the move, leaving a trail of cold, calculated destruction in its wake. Unseen Shadows the universe was vast, punctuated by pinpricks of light, each one a distant star, a beacon from galaxies afar. Amidst the sprawling canvas of the cosmos sat the rebel base. It wasn't grand or extravagant, its beauty lay in its unassuming nature. Compact modules linked by bridging tunnels and satellite antennae rose like bristling thorns against the inky backdrop. It was a hidden jewel, a place of hope and resistance, its location known to only a trusted few. At this tranquil edge of space, danger slithered forth, undetected and malevolent. Two colossal drac behemoths, constructs of nightmarish design, steadily made their approach. Their surfaces, dark and matte, absorbed any ambient light, rendering them near invisible against the obsidian curtain of space. The behemoths were unlike any other vessel in the galaxy. Their presence was not announced with a blaze or a roar, but with a chilling, silent intent. They drew closer to the rebel base, their gargantuan forms casting imperceptible shadows on the cosmos. Within the base, all seemed normal. LED lights blinked rhythmically, consoles beeped occasionally, and the sensors, the first line of defense, appeared to be functioning at optimal levels. Crew members took turns observing the vast screen displays, ensuring that their sanctuary remained undisturbed. Laughter and casual banter echoed in the hallways as off-duty personnel shared stories and plans for when the war would end. Their tales filled with hope for a brighter future, free from the oppressive grip of the drac. Unbeknownst to them, that very grip was stealthily inching closer. Meanwhile, in the expansive void outside, the lone patrolling fighter ship, the Silver Falcon, glided effortlessly. Its pilot, Lieutenant Varus, was a seasoned warrior, his eyes, accustomed to the variances in the cosmic panorama, continuously scanned the vistas for any anomalies. A simple patrol, just another day's task in the vastness of space. The stillness was usually a sign of peace, a welcome respite. But today, as Varus steered the Silver Falcon through a cloud of space dust, his sensors blipped an unusual pattern. He squinted, leaning closer to the dashboard, trying to decipher the abnormality. And then... Like ghostly apparitions emerging from a fog, the outlines of the drac behemoths began to materialize on his screen. They were still distant, 
but their massive forms were unmistakable, and they were headed straight for the rebel base. A cold surge of realization jolted through him. Control, this is Silver Falcon. We've got a situation. He shouted into the communicator, his voice tense with urgency. Two Drac behemoths are approaching the base and they're coming in stealth. Sensors at base might not detect them. Static answered him for a split second before a frantic voice responded. Silver Falcon, confirm your readings. Two behemoths, you say? Confirmed, Varus replied, pushing his thrusters to max, racing back towards the base to lend any help he could. I'm returning to the base, but raise the alarms now. We have very little time. As his warning rang out, the behemoths, sensing their cover might be blown, increased their pace, the intent of their mission clear. Strike fast, strike hard, and give the rebels no quarter. Back at the rebel base, the mood shifted from relaxed camaraderie to palpable tension. Their sanctuary, which had always been a beacon of hope, was now under the looming shadow of the formidable Drac forces. Awakening Chaos the heartbeats before chaos were eerily silent. Then, like a thunderclap tearing through a calm night, alarms echoed through the rebel base's metallic corridors. The once peaceful red and green LEDs that dotted control panels shifted to an urgent, pulsing red. The deafening siren was a brutal awakening, a reminder that war was at their doorstep. The hangars, usually bustling with routine checks and maintenance, turned into a hive of frenzied activity. Crew members threw open cabinets, grabbing flight suits, helmets, and weapons. Engineers and droids scuttled about, ensuring ships were ready for an immediate launch. The usually disciplined process of preparation was replaced by urgency, but no fear. Every second counted. Fighter pilots, realizing the gravity of the situation, wasted no time. They buckled in, the cockpits of their ships sealing shut with a pneumatic hiss, Engines, once cold, roared to life in a brilliant display of blue and white flames. One by one, the ships levitated, turned, and then, with a flash of thrust, zoomed out of the hangars, ready to meet the looming drac threat. In the heart of the base, within the fortress-like walls of the command center, a tall figure stood stoically, watching the screens that painted a grim picture. General Arcos, a war-hardened veteran with scars that told tales of countless battles, was not one to falter in the face of danger. He adjusted the collar of his uniform and cleared his throat. Communications, send out a priority one distress call to all rebel fleets and outposts. Drac forces are upon us. A young officer nodded, fingers flying across her console. Broadcasting now, General. Arcos turned to face the rest of the room. Defense teams to your stations. Gunners, man the turrets. We'll give our fighters the cover they need. He continued, his voice commanding, but not panicked. Evac teams, prepare for immediate evacuation if needed. Throughout the command center, his orders were met with swift nods and acknowledgments. In the midst of impending catastrophe, the rebels showcased what they were best known for. Unity in adversity and impeccable discipline. As Arcos was giving orders, Commander Talia, in charge of security and surveillance, beckoned him over. Her face, usually calm and collected, wore an expression of concern. General. She began, pointing to a holographic display of the base's security systems. Our outer sensors show no signs of malfunction. They're operating at 100%. But they miss two drac behemoths approaching. This isn't an oversight. It's sabotage. General Arcos frowned, the gravity of the revelation dawning on him. You're suggesting we have a traitor among us? Taelia nodded gravely. It seems so, sir. This kind of manipulation requires access, knowledge, and intent. The general's gaze hardened. Once we repel this attack, we'll root out this traitor. But for now, focus on the task at hand. But as he spoke, the thought gnawed at him. Treachery within their ranks? That was more dangerous than any external enemy. If they survived this onslaught, they'd have to turn their attention inward to cleanse the shadows lurking in their midst. Outside, the first wave of rebel fighters met the vast expanse of space, their formations tight and determined. But looming on the horizon were the Drac behemoths, monstrous and relentless. The stage was set for a confrontation that would test the mettle of every individual aboard the rebel base. Desperate Defense Above the rebel base, the cold expanse of space became a battlefield. The stars, once calm spectators, were now the backdrop to a desperate skirmish. The lone fighter that had initially spotted the Drac behemoths sped towards them, its pilot determined, if not a little reckless. 
The fighter's systems hummed, and its weapons locked onto the massive ship in its sights. Inside the fighter's cockpit, the pilot, Lieutenant Kale, adjusted his targeting systems. For the rebellion, he whispered to himself, fingers poised over the firing controls. But before he could unleash his ship's arsenal, a beam of incandescent energy emanated from one of the behemoths. The fighter didn't stand a chance. With a brilliant flare, the ship was no more, reduced to debris in mere moments. Witnessing the fighter's swift obliteration, the other rebel ships quickly formed squadrons, attempting to mount a coordinated attack. But the behemoths, with their advanced weaponry and nearly impenetrable shields, were a force to be reckoned with. Rebel ships danced around them, firing bursts of energy, trying to find a weak point. But with each passing second, another rebel vessel was picked off, its sacrifice only further highlighting the difference in might. Inside the rebel base's command center, an officer tried desperately to establish a communication line to the behemoths. Drac vessels, this is rebel base Alpha Point. We wish to negotiate a ceasefire. We are willing to surrender to prevent further loss of life. Please respond. But the only response was the silent continuation of the Drac assault, their actions speaking louder than any words. General Arcos watched the grim spectacle unfold on the command center's screens. His face was ashen, the weight of command heavy on his shoulders. Around him, the mood was somber, the room filled with an oppressive silence broken only by the occasional blip of a radar or a whispered order. Turning to Commander Taelia, Arcos's voice carried a note of defeat, but also determination. Initiate full evacuation protocols. We can't hold them off. It's time to save as many as we can. Taelia, ever the stoic figure, nodded. I'll oversee the evacuations. We have escape pods and smaller ships that can scatter and make it harder for the Drac to track. As she relayed orders, Arcos made one more plea over the communications channel, his voice echoing the desperation of their situation. All rebel ships disengage and return to base. We are initiating full evacuation. Protect the escape routes at all costs. But even as the order was given, a new hope emerged. From one of the hangars, two sleek arrow-shaped vessels emerged, their design contrasting sharply with the bulkier rebel ships. Their engines shimmered with a unique hue, signaling the presence of advanced FTL drives. As they maneuvered into open space, they darted around, evading drac fire with agility that was nothing short of awe-inspiring. The command center crew watched with bated breath as the two vessels danced their deadly ballet. Then, just as a drac beam came perilously close to one of the ships, both engaged their FTL drives, disappearing in a brilliant streak of light, leaving the battlefield behind. A murmur of hope ran through the command center. Those ships carried vital information, data, and possibly high-ranking rebel officials. Their escape was a small victory in what seemed like an inevitable defeat. Arcos, looking on, allowed himself a small, grim smile. The fight isn't over, he murmured. But as the Drac behemoths bore down on the rebel base, that fight was about to become even more challenging. Drac's Fury in the midst of space, the rebel base, which had once been a beacon of hope for many, now stood surrounded by two monstrous drac behemoths. The giant ships, casting a long shadow upon the base, seemed almost impatient in their silent wait. The base, in contrast, looked fragile, its defenses weakened and morale crushed. Inside what remained of the command center of the rebel base, Commander Arcos sat heavily in his chair, exhaustion evident in every line of his face. The room around him was bathed in a red hue from the emergency lights, casting eerie shadows on the walls. Monitors flickered intermittently, some already gone dark. The weight of impending doom hung thick in the air. Taking a deep breath, he reached for the communication console, his fingers hovering above the distress button. The few crew members who were left turned their attention to him, waiting for his next move. This is Rebel Base Alpha Point's last call he began, voice trembling but resolute. To anyone listening, we are under siege. The Drac are here, and they have breached our defenses. We suspect sabotage. Someone on the inside allowed them to get this close undetected. Trust no one. He paused, swallowing hard. If you hear this, make your way to Omega Base. That's the new rallying point. Stay away from here, and remember, there's a traitor among us. Do not... His words were cut short by a massive explosion that shook the base. As Arcos was thrown off his feet, the communication line went dead, the screen turning to static. 
Outside, the two Drac behemoths had begun their methodical annihilation of the rebel base. Arcs of destructive energy crisscrossed space, turning structures into ash and metal into molten fragments. Escape pods and smaller vessels attempted to flee, but they were picked off with chilling efficiency. In mere minutes, what had been a proud symbol of resistance was reduced to a scattering of debris amidst the vast expanse of space. Once the last echo of the destruction faded, the behemoths, having completed their grim task, slowly started their retreat. The space around them now held a graveyard's silence, broken only by the occasional piece of debris pinging against their impenetrable hulls. On the bridge of the lead drac behemoth, the atmosphere was starkly different. The dimly lit space was dominated by a massive view screen, now showcasing the remnants of the rebel base. Drac officers moved with purpose, each at their station, maintaining the behemoth's immense systems. At the center of the bridge stood the Drac commander, a towering figure with scales shimmering in the muted light. He observed the destruction for a few moments, his expression inscrutable. Then, with a nod of satisfaction, he turned to his communication officer. Open a channel to Sector Commander Carvan. The officer quickly complied, and the image of Carvan, the mastermind of this assault, appeared on screen. Report. Carvan's voice was cold, expecting success. The mission is complete. The commander replied succinctly. Rebel Base Alpha Point is no more. A pause lingered, Carvan's eyes narrowing. The traitor's sabotage of the sensors? It worked flawlessly. The commander responded, a hint of pride in his voice. They had no idea we were approaching. Excellent. Carvon replied, satisfaction evident. And commander? He added. Well done. As the transmission ended, the Drac commander allowed himself a rare, fleeting smile. The might of the Drac had been showcased, and the rebels were given a brutal reminder of the vast gulf that stood between them. In the cold, unforgiving void of space, the ashes of the destroyed rebel base bore silent testimony to the Drac's unyielding fury. Distress signal from Alpha Point. The bridge of the Rebel battlecruiser was an impressive sight. A vast expanse of state-of-the-art tech stations, large screens depicting various sections of space, and a centralized command seat. Dominating the helm, Prince Arlen guided the conversation, taking in the panoramic view of the starscape outside. I still can't believe we got out of there, Davin. Arlon mused, recounting their narrow escapes and encounters at the Rebel base. Feels like ages ago. Davin chuckled, a glint in his eye. The tales we can tell. And here we are, going on another adventure. Only this time, we have company from the other side of the fence. Arlen glanced at Rice and Lyra, the Federation duo. Lyra, with her sleek silver hair and distinct Federation attire, stood slightly aloof, taking in the unfamiliar surroundings. Beside her, Rice looked equally out of place, but his demeanor was one of keen interest. You know... Lyra began with a wistful tone. Seeing the Federation ships will be like a breath of fresh air. I've missed the sleek design, the precise maneuvering. Most of all, I've missed Kirin fruit. The tanginess, the sweet aftertaste. Ah, Federation food. Trust me, they're to die for. Rice chuckled, nodding. I'm dreaming of a big bowl of Nuello stew. Haven't had it since we started this mission. Seems like a lifetime ago. Davin raised an eyebrow, curiosity evident. Nuello stew? Kirin fruit? They sound... Exotic. Lyra smirked. Trust me, they're to die for. Once we rendezvous with the Federation fleet, I'll make sure you get a taste. Rice nodded. It's a deal. We'll exchange some of our Federation favorites for a taste of your rebel specialties. Before Arlen could share stories of traditional rebel feasts, a sudden interruption came in the form of a persistent beep from the communications desk. The playful and nostalgic atmosphere that had settled on the bridge was instantly replaced by tension. The communications officer, a young rebel with sharp features and alert eyes, looked up with concern. Sir, I've intercepted a signal. It seems to be from Alpha Point. All chatter ceased. Alpha Point was the heart of the rebel movement. If there was a distress call from there, it meant something was horribly amiss. The signal was rough, filled with static. They strained their ears to catch the fragments. To anyone listening, siege, drac, sabotage, trust no one. A heavy silence draped the bridge. The message's implications were unmistakable. Arlon gripped the armrests of his seat, the weight of command pressing on him. Plot a course back to Alpha Point, he ordered, voice low and filled with dread. But Lyra stepped forward, 
her tone cautious. Arlen, if that message was broadcasted, it means they believe there's no hope left. Going back might be... I can't just leave them behind. Arlon snapped, his emotions evident. Rice, ever the mediator, interjected gently. We understand, Arlon, but we need to think strategically. If the Drac have reached Alpha Point, we need to regroup and plan. The room was tense, filled with unsaid emotions and thoughts. Among them, Davin's reaction, or lack thereof, was palpable. His usually animated demeanor was eerily subdued, which drew questioning glances. Yet given the gravity of the situation, most assumed it was shock or an internal struggle with the dire news. And as the weight of the message from Alpha Point settled on the crew, the path ahead seemed uncertain. There was no turning back, but the road forward was fraught with peril and tough choices. Federation Concern The Federation vessel, the Argus, one of three mighty human battlecruisers en route to a rendezvous with the rebels, glided seamlessly through the cold void of deep space. Its pristine metallic sheen, symbolic of human engineering prowess, shimmered against the backdrop of distant stars. Inside, the command center was a symphony of hushed tones, as officers exchanged information and manned their stations. Above them, holographic screens displayed various sections of space, constantly updating with new data. Commander Elara Vance, a tall woman with striking silver eyes, monitored the crew's efficiency from her captain's chair. She was known for her meticulous nature, an attribute that had seen her through many challenging missions. Her contemplation was interrupted by a soft chime. The communications officer, Lieutenant Mercer, raised his head, his face visibly pale. Commander, we've picked up a distress signal. It's from Alpha Point. The air in the room grew thick with tension. Commander Vance immediately motioned for the message to be played. The garbled words echoed through the chamber, the urgency clear despite the static. Siege. Drac. Sabotage. Trust no one. Alara's expression hardened, her mind racing. Get the senior officers in the briefing room, now. Within minutes, the room was occupied by the ship's top brass. The dim lighting cast elongated shadows, further intensifying the atmosphere. We've all heard the message. Alara began, her voice steady. Our rendezvous with the rebel fleet is in three days. We need to assess the implications of this new development. Captain Riker, a seasoned officer with a gruff demeanor, was first to speak. Alpha Point was the rebels' primary stronghold. If it's fallen, the balance has shifted. Lieutenant Kara, the ship's chief strategist, activated the galactic map. It spread out on the table, a myriad of blinking lights representing planets, bases, and ship routes. Our rendezvous point is here, she pointed, while Alpha Point lies here. Given the current trajectories and speeds, we won't cross paths with any DRAC forces heading from Alpha Point for at least five days. Commander Vance studied the map. What you're saying is, our rendezvous is not under immediate threat from the DRAC. Kara nodded. Correct, Commander. But it doesn't make our situation any less precarious. The fall of Alpha Point signifies a major strategic advantage for the DRAC. A murmur of agreement filled the room. Ilara's jaw tightened. All right. Our primary mission remains unchanged. We rendezvous with the rebel fleet, but I want us there faster. If the Drac are on the move, I want every advantage we can get. Captain Riker raised an eyebrow. The engines are already at peak efficiency, Commander. She turned to the chief engineer, Lieutenant Farrow, a young but brilliant mind who had risen through the ranks due to his unparalleled knowledge of the ship's systems. Farrow, can we squeeze out any more speed? He hesitated, then with determination replied, I can try to reroute some auxiliary power to the main thrusters. It might give us a slight edge, maybe shave off a few hours, but it's going to strain the systems. Do it, Ilara commanded. I'd rather strain our engines than be caught off guard by the DRAC. Lieutenant Farrow nodded and promptly exited, his team following close behind, ready to implement the modifications. As the meeting dispersed, Commander Vance took a moment to gaze out of the viewport. The vast expanse of space stretched endlessly, its depth hiding secrets, threats, and challenges. The message from Alpha Point was a stark reminder that in the great cosmic dance, the next step was always unpredictable. She just hoped they were making the right one. The Eighth Fleet's Plan In the vast expanse of space, Orinthia, with its cerulean glow, stood as a beacon of hope. Orbiting above, the indomitable might of the Eighth Fleet served as a testament to the resilience of the Federation. 
The aftermath of the fierce confrontation with the Drac behemoths had left scars on both the planet below and the ships above. Yet the spirit of unity and determination thrived. Within the flagship's main conference chamber, General Zorvan, commander of the Eighth Fleet, stood pensively. The room, awash with the shimmer of advanced tech displays, set the stage for one of the most crucial strategic councils the Federation would ever witness. At the heart of their discussion, maintaining the technological edge over the Drac. As it stands, Zorvan began, his tone solemn yet firm, our EMP devices are now known to the Drac. If we rely on their efficacy at the next encounter, we could get a rude awakening, especially if the Drac developed any countermeasures. We need to evolve, anticipate the Drac's adaptations. Captain Elson, never one to mince words, leaned forward. Agreed. Our dependence on the EMPs could be our undoing. The Drac will study, adapt, and counteract. Dr. Callista Fail, the lead engineer whose work had revolutionized many of the Federation's tech assets, activated a holographic display. The spinning representation of their current EMP bomb filled the room. The challenge ahead is multifaceted. The DRAC will prioritize neutralizing our EMP advantage. We need to be several steps ahead. General Zorvan nodded. Present your innovations. Dr. Torin Vash, a rising star among the Federation's engineering ranks, presented the first proposal. Micro-shielding, he began, pointing at a layered representation of the EMP. This encapsulation ensures that the EMPs are almost invisible to conventional sensors. It's like hiding a needle in a haystack. But, Captain Elson interjected, doesn't this shielding dilute the effective range of the EMP pulse? Dr. Fail countered, it does to an extent. However, we have another avenue, miniaturization. She then showcased a downsized model of the EMP. Reducing its size by half makes it more agile, more difficult to detect. True, the resultant pulse will be smaller. But consider this, a swarm, thousands of these dispersed in a coordinated fashion. It's not about the intensity anymore. It's about volume and unpredictability. Zorvan, always appreciative of forward thinking, posed a query. Have we considered integrating both? Micro-shielded, miniaturized EMPs? The engineers exchanged glances, the possibility evident in their eyes. Dr. Fail responded, It's ambitious. The R&D would be intense, but it's feasible. The general's expression hardened. Begin prototyping immediately. We'll run battle simulations by the end of the cycle. As the conversation continued, another officer, Lieutenant Mara, introduced another tactical proposal. General, while the EMPs are being innovated, We've been researching a new drone tech. Think of them as decoys, drawing Drac fire and sensors away from our main fleet and the revamped EMPs. Zorvan, intrigued, urged her to go on. They mimic our ship's energy signatures, making it nearly impossible for the Drac to differentiate between real vessels and decoys. This, coupled with the new EMPs, could wreak havoc on Drac formations. The room hummed with the energy of possibilities. The combination of revamped EMPs and advanced decoy tech could reshape the balance of power in their ongoing conflict with the Drac. We're at a pivotal point, Zorvan concluded, his voice echoing determination. If we can develop your ideas and get them scaled up, the Drac won't know what hit them. Let's get to work. As the assembly dispersed, the magnitude of their task loomed large. Yet, with leaders like Zorvan and minds like Fael and Vash, hope was more than just a sentiment. It was a tangible force. Above Orinthia, the Eighth Fleet prepared for the next phase of the interstellar chess game. The Blue Planet Gambit. Within the flagship's main conference chamber, the massive holographic projection table at its center displayed an intricate network of stars and planetary bodies. A small, isolated blue dot blinked, drawing the room's collective attention. Zorvan pointed to the blue speck. This, he stated, may be our next point of contention. Captain Verrill, squinting at the representation, asked, What significance does this remote planet hold? It's barely charted in our logs. Zorvan continued, Its significance is not in its resources or its inhabitants, but its location. It sits on a vital junction. If the Drac were to control it, they would have a direct channel to our core planets. Commander Iana chimed in, a hint of surprise in her voice. But it's lightly defended. From what we know, it's mostly uninhabited. Why haven't we fortified it? Zorvan sighed. In our focus on primary battlefronts, we've overlooked such border planets, but that doesn't mean our adversaries will. 
A murmur of unease spread. Lieutenant Rowe speculated, Could it be a trap? Perhaps the Drac want us to divert our resources there? Admiral Threx, a seasoned veteran, countered, Or they may genuinely view it as a strategic asset. Either way, we can't afford to ignore it. Zorvan interjected, his voice decisive. Trap or not, we fortify and defend. We'll not cede one inch of Federation space without a fight. Orinthia has enough defenses for now. The Eighth Fleet will move to protect the Blue Planet. A data officer quickly cross-referenced their logs. Sir, our archives don't say much about it. Local scans from our last survey mission dubbed it Akiria. Minor fauna, breathable atmosphere, but nothing remarkable. One last thing. Zorvan interposed, scanning the room. Do we have an ETA on the two Helian battlecruisers? A communications officer swiftly responded. Yes, General Zorvan. They're due to arrive in approximately 30 hours. Good. Zorvan nodded. Let them know we're going to be at Akiria. Send them updated coordinates for a rendezvous there. For Akiria, I want reconnaissance. Zorvan instructed. And not just long range. I want eyes and boots on the ground. Before we make our stand, we need to know what we're standing on. Yes, General. Acknowledged Commander Iyana already initiating preparations. Zorvan turned to Admiral Threx. Prepare the fleet. You and I will lead the vanguard. Leave six battlecruisers with Orinthia. The rest will accompany us. The room, once humming with debate and speculation, was now a hive of activity, with officers and aides finalizing ship assignments, resources, and strategy. The next few hours were a whirlwind. The star-studded blackness of space became animated as starships started aligning in formation. On the flagship's bridge, Zorvan watched with silent pride. The Federation, despite its challenges, was an entity of resilience and unity. With a final check and nod from Admiral Threx, Zorvan ordered, Engage FTL drives. Set course for Akiria. A symphony of lights and sounds enveloped the fleet. The faster-than-light engines, marvels of engineering and physics, ignited in a radiant display. Space and time seemed to fold, and in mere moments the Eighth Fleet, comprising thirty majestic vessels, disappeared into the void, leaving behind a brief, luminous trail. Beyond, in the vast frontier of the galaxy, lay Akiria, a mysterious blue planet that had unwittingly become a linchpin in the interstellar conflict. As the Federation fleet raced toward it, the future remained uncertain, but their resolve was unmistakable.